Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Ali and I'm back with another video here. Um, this is a really cool one. I uh, was really, really excited for this build. Um, it's not going to be again a very long form video or a long form build, but yeah, it's it's going to be a really nice one. So yeah, stick along with the ride, y'all. Um, and this in this one, we're going to be doing something interesting and this will be, we'll be building a newsletter uh, application. And by the way, I wanted to make this, uh, let me first of all give you guys a demo. So this is how it looks like. There's literally nice animations going on. We see the opening title animation and there's this newsletter one. And there's a really nice uh, input field which we, which we have created here. And of course it's disabled by default. But let's say if I uh, enter something in, watch what happens right here. And when I click on enter, watch exactly what happens on the Submit field, there's a plane icon, swoosh, and that will happen like it flies over the uh, on your website. It looks really, really cool, by the way. And you can see we have this animation then, which actually tells us that we are already added to the waitlist. So uh, it will tell us uh, when we actually launch our newsletter or whatever you want to launch. Basically, it, it sort of works for a waitlist as well. Um, but I wanted to sort of combine this with my newsletter and the waitlist. And as you guys can literally see, it's deployed. Um, literally, it, it's deployed on my on my website domain. So I'm gonna be doing some really cool things with this because I'm planning on to release more videos uh, on this. Like this is literally the first iteration. So we're gonna be building in this like first iteration. We're literally gonna be building a newsletter here. But I would be extending this later on. We literally see this guy wasn't added before, so he's added right now to our mailing list. And of course, if even if I type something like from let's say a new type of email, if I press subscribe, we see this beautiful animation popping uh, from top to bottom. This fading on the bottom, and all of them by all of this by the way ha has been done with Tailwind CSS. So we are not using any crazy library for the subtle animations here, but we are going to be using a GSAP animation library uh, for the subscribe button right here which is really easy and i'll be showing you guys of course everything and as always the source code for this is completely open source so i'm planning again uh, on to do many iterations for this uh, kind of website where i'll be going through the project section and like different sort of sections this one however we'll just be focusing on a really really beautiful newsletter kind of thing so it'll be a short and nice uh, build which we'll be doing and by the way for the emailing service we'll be using something called mailchimp so uh, it's, of course, we are going to be implementing and integrating MailChimp with our uh, Next.js, the new app directory and everything. So that would be cool as well. And we'll be also using Next.js API routes. So these are the new API routes that were introduced with the app directory. However, they're also like pushing server actions right, right now. Um, and I also use server actions for this build, but it was kind of, uh, you know, it was because it's, it's still experimental. So it was bugging out. So I went uh, with the API routes. It'll be a good introduction to API routes as well for anyone who wants to implement any of the Node.js backend stuff. Um, and yeah, this is a really good, gonna be an exciting build. So yeah, let's literally get started with this. Uh, how are we gonna be building this? There's gonna be, uh, of course, it seems very simple, but there's uh, some stuff behind this, like MailChimp integration and some stuff like that. Um, but there's no database integration, however, in this build. Uh, however, uh, of course, I'll be doing many iterations as I said before. So don't worry if you guys literally like this one. I'll be extending this with a lot of different sections like projects and and you guys could literally go ahead and do it on yourself as well. Like it's, it's just a really good build to learn from and then extend it um, as a however you guys wish. And a huge shout out I want to give to uh, Cronark actually. The opening animation is actually inspired by his website. Uh, I've linked his website in the description and also his GitHub repo. Uh, so please, please check check his, check his uh, portfolio website out. It looks really, really insane. Um, and yeah, let's actually dive into it right now. So first thing uh, I wanna do as always, let's open our terminal. And let's literally get started with the app right away. Let's dive into the code now, into the fun part. And I'm gonna be, uh, directing into my builds directory so i'm going to be navigating into my builds um, and you guys could literally create the folder anywhere 
and I'm going to open recursive search by pressing Control R because uh, I like to use this really a lot of the times. And then we're going to be using npx create next app for this. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm using next app and not the t example thing like we used to before is because this is the newer way and then they actually ask you all the stuff if you really want to install Tailwind or if you want to install anything else. So it's a really nice way to get started. So I'm just going to name it newsletter app uh, YouTube. You can literally name it whatever you want. As soon as we literally press enter, it will give us the latest app directory, like all the latest Next.js stuff. And it will ask us uh, for some prompts. So what's it it's going to ask us? It's going to ask us for TypeScript. We are going to be using TypeScript, so yes. Uh, it's going to ask us for some linting. This will give us some really nice, useful uh, error-prone benefits. So I'm going to say yes. Also, yes for Tailwind. We always want to use Tailwind. Uh, would you like to use the source directory? We can literally just go with the default. No. If you want to use source directory, uh, there's I think there's some steps you have to do. I'm not sure if you literally have to do it in the app directory, but it's just a different way of organizing your folder structures. But you can literally, if you want to use it, you can just say yes. Uh, but I want to use the app router as well. That's the recommended approach. We don't want to go with the old uh, pages directory approach. So I'm going to say yes. We also don't want to customize the default import areas uh, because it comes with nice um, um, syntax, the import areas. So I want to go with that one. But yeah, let me know, guys, what you guys uh, think about the website here. Um, I think it looks really, really nice. Um, for the first iteration, it looks really cool. Um, and yeah, it, even the input field, I'm, I'm really in love with this the the plane the flying animation it really ca caught anyone's eyes like it if, if it doesn't catch your eye let me know but yeah i mean it looks really nice and clean when the plane like literally flies off and um it looks beautiful and of course uh, if you guys are wondering how do i find these designs i literally just search them on dribble and behance and i literally found this plane flying animation on dribble and behance and i just yeah integrated this with react and then just built it so yeah, this is how I uh, find my designs. But yeah, we have our app uh, in initialized. So what we can do is literally navigate into the directory. So I'm literally gonna go into that directory and I'm using Visual Studio Code. So what I do is I just, since I'm on my Mac, I use the insiders version. So I'm just gonna say code insiders space dot to open this directly inside of my Visual Studio Code. And here we go, we have uh, the beautiful, the structure and our app right away um, open here so let's literally get started with this what I'm gonna do the first thing is I want to literally uh, put this on my desktop one I had these nice desktop setups I like to keep everything uh, the code all of the stuff in my desktop one and everything else on my desktop two. it just it's just a nice workflow I like to follow uh, but yeah you guys can literally do however you like uh, but yeah let's uh, literally close the Sidebar. So first of all, we see if you're really new to Next.js and everything, um, it's going to be a really beginner friendly tutorial. So there's nothing to worry about. So it's for literally everyone. It's not something we're not going to do something crazy or advanced level shit. Um, so, yeah, definitely stick with stick uh, with me and I'm going to be explaining all the things step by step. And yeah, so in my previous video, I explained a lot about the app directory and how the routing and everything else works inside of the app directory. So if you literally didn't watch that, Go check that out and that you literally learn about routing and the file structure and all that stuff but in this one i'm going to focus more on the api routes which i didn't actually uh teach in the previous video so that will be the goal for this video but the first thing we see in our app directory is this page.tsx this is going to be our home page so what i'm going to do first of all is i'm literally going to start our server um by opening our terminal so i'm going to press command j and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna type in npm run dev to start our server. So if you see a package log file, you should be using npm. And if you see a yarn log, then you should be using yarn. It doesn't matter, honestly, uh, but yeah, I'm just using npm since I have a package log here. So I'm gonna run our server. And now let's go back to Google Chrome and let's literally open the local version for our website and close the other tab. And literally we see a beautiful Next.js template out of the box. And that's because we are seeing this whole bunch of code uh, right in our dev. So what I'm gonna do is actually delete all the stuff since we're not gonna be needing this code. I'm also gonna be removing the styling here. And as for the image tag, I, we don't need the image tag anymore. And we see it's completely black now. 
Um, what I want to do is I want to I want to really really clean slate for uh, clean slate for Tailwind as well. So I'm gonna navigate into my global CSS. And I'm gonna delete all of this stuff. Uh, it comes by default with the Next.js app directory. And inside of our main tag, I'm just gonna type in uh, just hello world for now. Um, and let's save this and let's just go back to our app. And we see this is a clean slate as we used to get before with Tailwind. A uh, really, really easy setup. And by the way, something I forgot to mention again, that we are also going to be learning about SEO in this video. So uh, stick with the <laughs> stick with me if you want to know some SEO plugs in there, because we literally got like almost like 100 score now uh, since the new release of the metadata API by Nextjs uh, app directory. So if you're really not using app directory, you're missing out on SEO. Uh, they really mean it. And you literally get like all of your scores are like, especially the SEO scores are like 100, like literally easy 100 uh, with the, your portfolio website or anything, which will be a really good demonstration to any employer or stuff like that. But yeah, let's actually get started with this. So what do we want to do first in our application is we are going to be having loads of stuff in our home page. So on our home page, the structure is going to look something like this. If we're going to be having basically, so if we go back to our finished application, we have this section right here and there's going to be some form stuff and then there's going to be some footer or some socials uh, stuff here. So the structure will basically be like this, where we have like a newsletter. So this is going to be a component. So I'm just going to, I just like to map it like this. So we just have like a newsletter form component and then we are also going to have a socials section. So I'm just going to like map this out. So this is also going to be a component. So we have a newsletter form. We'll have a socials component. On the top here, we're going to have some, you can literally say hero component, but I didn't create this as a component. I just kept it as a test. Um, I just kept it as a diff. And inside this day, we're going to have an h2 and an h1 tag here uh, for our titles and animations, uh, this stuff here. So that's what we're going to be having on the top here. So let, let's literally get started with uh, with these headings and let's literally make them really beautiful and customized for everyone. By the way, just to mention uh, here, I'm just using literally a green color. So if you guys want to are building your portfolio website or anything like that, you can literally just change these gradient values. I'm using my own personalized ones. It, it matches with, with my channel's theme and everything. So I'm just keeping it purple. But it, it literally, I've, I have created these gradient values in, in a custom gradient class. And I'll literally show you guys how you can change it for and customize it accordingly to your own need. But yeah, let's literally get started with this. So the first thing we want to do is we want to type in here, join the wait list for my, and this is a more of a H2 tab because of course it's the main tag we want to focus on is the H1, which is the biggest, like the heading uh, we have here. And this is going to be like newsletter for me. If you have a wait list kind of thing, you literally put wait list here. Um, uh, something else here, whatever you want. But I'm literally going to put join the wait list for my newsletter. That's what I'm going to do. The next thing we want to do is we want to style our main tag first of all. A main tag is important. We want to style this accordingly. So I'm going to put a background color here. And this is not exactly a, back, a black uh, background color. It's going to be a value of 03040B. So it's not exactly black. It's like a subtle different black because I don't like to use complete black and white colors. Uh, they don't resonate very well with the eyes. Uh, but yeah, it's literally a subtle black color. Um, and then we have item center. So I'm, I'm making this whole container flex and then flex column because we want this to stack on top of each other. And then we want to say items center, justify center, uh, padding over all of 10. And we also want to give a mid height of screen to this because you want to make sure this actually goes all the way on this height. Right now, of course, we don't see our text there. We see this is actually highlighted, but this is black. So we don't actually aren't able to see this. But now let's actually style this div. So this div is gonna just have some um, vertical spacing between the children of one. And again, these are all Tailwind classes. So uh, the reason I'm getting these intelligence, so if you're new to Tailwind or anything, uh, you can literally go ahead in your extensions, type in Tailwind. And you literally see this beautiful extension by Tailwind Labs called Tailwind CSS IntelliSense. And this way you will be, whenever you hover over any class, you'll be getting this nice CSS class name, uh, CSS. And if you're literally using CSS now for personal projects, please stop doing it because it takes a lot of time. 
and not doing CSS or anything, uh, but we are still using CSS by using Thielen, right? So um, it, it's com it's really fast, makes you really productive and focus on the core aspects of your application. So I really like to stick to Thielen. And um, yeah, they're just doing great work. Now let's move on to our heading two. For a heading two, I'm gonna give a heading two a Z index value. I'm also gonna give it a text to Excel because uh, I want this text to look uh, really huge. Actually, it's gonna be three Excel. And this, uh, again, remember, so Taven styles in, inside of Taven, these are all utility classes and they are mobile first. So what it means is every style we're writing here, it's gonna be for mobile first. And then we're gonna be writing styles for the desktop and they have like different breakpoint stuff. So we have like medium, which is like 768 pixels. We have small, which is 640 pixels. We have large. These are all default break breakpoints, but you can literally customize this really easily by just navigating onto Tailwind's website and literally just typing and customizing breakpoints and literally you can customize however you uh, wish to. But yeah, this uh, Tailwind approach is gonna be a mobile first approach. So we wanna, we wanna write styles for the mobile first and then navigate ourselves to desktop and bigger screens. Um, so we have text center. We are also gonna have our text of transparent. And we also want to have a duration and that's gonna be for, duration is gonna be a thousand. And this is of course gonna be for the transition stuff. We also have BG white and we also wanna have cursor default. And there's a reason why I want to have all these things. And then we're going to also have text stroke. Uh, the reason we have text transparent, you might be wondering, why the hell do we have text transparent? Because if we have text transparent, then we won't be actually able to see the text, right? And you're completely right. The reason we have text transparent is because we're going to be putting background clip of text. So we are going to be clipping our background. And then that's a really neat property inside of Tailman which allows us to like literally um, style our text in gradient format. So it, because if we just keep the values as text, we cannot actually use the gradient values on our text. So we have to do this uh, text clipping thing, which is really nice. And we also have a text stroke property, which is basically when, uh, so if I show you guys text stroke, whenever I refresh my website, watch what happens here. There, there's this, uh, uh, the text, there's a black background and we see this nice border. This is actually this stroke. We literally see the strokes on the outer uh, values of the join the wait list uh, thing, which is actually the text stroke actually. So that's a custom class, which we're gonna be creating inside of our globals uh, CSS. But that's what we, that will be text stroke. Let's keep on doing this. We will also create some really nice custom um, animations in this build. So the, this one is gonna be anime title. And again, I'm literally, getting this, these animation values from Chronox repo. Um, he did an amazing job of, of this, uh, animating the opening title. I tweaked the values a bit according to my use case. Uh, but yeah, that's how I'm literally getting all these values. So we're gonna be have, creating these two custom classes, text stroke and animate title. And on a smaller screen, I want my text to be five XL. On a medium screen, I want my text to be six XL. This is how I, you give breakpoints. Smaller screen, you want it to be more bigger. And then on a medium screen, which is like tablet sizes and above, you want it to be 60 pixels. And I also want to say white space, no wrap, uh, for so your text doesn't actually wrap, right? And then the last thing, this is very important. We have to make sure the background clip is of text value. Again, this is the same thing. What we're going to do is clip the background so we can literally provide a gradient value uh, for this thing. And I, let's literally go back and literally see we can see our beautiful text here, right? And the reason uh, right now it's actually white because the background of the text is white and we wanted to keep the, the background here um, white uh, at, the, at this point. So we just kept it white like this. Um, but if you want gradient on this uh, heading, you can literally put like um, basically background gradient. Uh, and then of course the Tailwind utility classes from purple to whatever you wanna do, which we are gonna be doing for the newsletter one. So we'll see how it actually works. And lastly, what we wanna do is we wanna add these two custom classes, the anime title and the text stroke. So we literally see the, the animation effect. But before actually I do that, let's style our H1 tag as well. So for the H1 also, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have some similar styles, um, but there will be some differences. The text will be smaller, um, the font will be bold, 
uh, sorry, the text will be bigger because you're going to make sure it's big. And then the text will be center as well. The text is transparent. So the duration is going to be 1000 here again. And the background, we want it to be white. And the background, we want it to be white. But now th this is where the fun happens, right? So we are assigning a gradient value here. A gradient value here. So what I have, I have chosen for my use case is purple 300. So I'm choosing two gradient values. So it starts on from the left side. And the reason it starts from the left is because what I'm doing is I'm going to be doing um, background gradient two, right? So what I'm going to be doing is after I write it background white here, I'm going to be saying background gradient two, right? So you can use these, any of these ones. So basically what these actually mean is background gradient two, right? Means that you're going to start from 300 and you're going to go all your, all your way towards the right. And then you have a value called two. So that's the value you're going to apply when you move towards the right, which literally you guys will understand in just a minute. So I'm going to say purple 800 here, and we're going to also have an animate, uh, a custom animation here, which is going to, we're going to be calling this animate fade in of three. Also one more thing, uh, I missed a couple of things here, which is like cursor default and a smaller screen. We want the text to be bigger. So we want it to be six XL medium. We want it to be seven XL. And we also want to make sure our white space no wrap is true. And the most important, which I forgot, is background clip text. And the reason we want to make sure we have this is because if I actually don't do this, literally see what happens, guys. Here, this literally is the background, actually. So what we want to do is clip this to to the text. So this applies on the text, not as as the actual background. So this is the reason uh, our background clip text is such an important property. And we literally see it looks exactly identical to my French book. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, you can literally go ahead and tweak these values. So if I, let's say I do something like uh, 100, uh, this will be lighter on the left side. We literally see this is more light. And if you make it more darker, let's say 900, it's more darker, of course, and so on. And you literally, you can literally even play around with different uh, values. So if you don't want purple, maybe you want red. You can literally make this red. So you see this is like red now. And literally, I just made it purple because, of course, it matches with my theme and everything. But this is how you can customize your own sort of gradient value. And it looks really nice and clean as well. Now we want to create three custom stuff, uh, uh, which is going to be text stroke, anime title, and anime fade in free. So first of all, let's go back to our global CSS. And let's actually create our text stroke thing. So what I'm going to be doing is in team in, in, in the, why, the reason I navigated to global CSS, by the way, is because uh, how you actually customize stuff in Tuvin is you can literally give these custom classes. So let's say you didn't want all of this stuff in here and you literally wanted to customly uh, have all these properties inside of your uh, custom class. You can literally give a class here in, in global CSS. And the way you do that is you access the layer. Um, and th these are again given to you by Tuvin. And you literally access your base. So I'm not going to be doing in components. I'm going to be doing this in base. And then you literally, um, you can say, actually, it would be better to do this in components. And these are just basically the the sem semantics you can think of CSS. Like where do you want this to be structured in? In the base or in the com? It doesn't really matter a lot, but it's just a nice semantical way. So base are things like, for instance, H1 tags, H2 tags, like generic tags in, in html that's what the base will come in like it, it, your body for instance or html tag these are all like base things and components are more like you can think of like your higher level components so like you have a container or you have some stuff like you have all these classes so those this is how i think about base and components uh, but this is just um, that stuff now we literally have our text stroke uh text stroke class uh which we given right there what this class is gonna have is actually this is gonna be having these properties. So oops, actually copied something else. I'm actually gonna copy it again and literally paste this in here. So we have our text stroke class and we have to give this property called text stroke. And the reason we have to put WebKit here is so it works for all these different uh, browsers uh, because I I don't think it, uh, if you don't put WebKit it doesn't work for certain browsers. So that's the reason you wanna put WebKit here. And here we just want to provide our out like the value of the border which appears there, and then give it a color. So now, if I actually save this, and if you let literally go back 
Um, I, I don't think we'll be able to see it right now because the animation doesn't, we didn't actually have the animation. Uh, but what will happen once we have the animation there, we'll literally see our text stroke uh, being active and literally see these borders um, when we refresh this and we see this animation happening. So let's actually do and create that animation now. So we have our text stroke in. The next thing we want to do is we want to create our animation. It's going to be the animate title thing. Now for our animate title, uh, where are we going to be creating this uh, animate title animation? Well, we'll be creating this inside of our uh, Tailwind configuration. And what I mean by Tailwind configuration is we literally can navigate to a file called tailwind.config. This comes by default uh, with Tailwind. And we can, uh, what we can do here, we see some default values, the Nexus theme literally added here for their background images. We don't want this, so I'm just going to remove this for now. And we see the, these has nice purging stuff going on here as this pages, components, and app directory. Uh, we don't require the pages, but I'm, I'm just going to keep it in case. Uh, but now we're going to be focusing on the title animation. So what we can literally do is if you press command and space, we'll literally get our all of, uh, of our intelligence of what we can, the team, the stuff we can extend to. And this is how you can literally uh, configure team and stuff and extend your animations. Because by default, if you literally check in here, uh, we see some default animation values. So these are all the animation values which are provided by Tailwind CSS themselves. So they have a spin animation, a ping, a pulse. I've used these animations in, in uh, previous of my builds. So you can literally go ahead and check it, but these are some subtle animations they provided, but we need a custom animation. So how are we gonna do that? Is we can literally extend uh, our animation things so what I can do here is I can literally type in animation and this is a CSS um, property, right? We see animation is a CSS property. Now what I can do is literally open this as an object. And now all I have to actually do is type in my animation name. Uh, first one is gonna be called title. And what I'll actually do is I'll literally copy this one and then I'll literally uh, show you guys what I mean. So this is going to be our animation. It's gonna be called title. Then we're gonna, and if you literally don't uh, understand how we use animations in CSS, literally go ahead and type in animation CSS, and you literally see a guide on how to use like animations. And basically, how we do animations is like we have the name of the animation, and then we provide some keyframes uh, for the animation for the the property or the stuff to animate to. That's literally how we do animations in CSS. So I give a name here for my, and the reason I give a title because it makes sense, right? It's a title animation. Uh, it could be anything. And then this is gonna be titled the name again. I want the animation. Uh, so this thing here, right? Again, you can literally go ahead and check this, but this is like the, the duration of the animation for how long you want the animation to go on. This is of course the timing function. And of course, this is again, the, the forward thing, how do you want the animation to look like? So the animation is gonna be named title. The next thing you want to focus on is the keyframes, as I mentioned before. Again, you can literally type in your command space and literally get these intelligence. And now for the keyframes, I'm going to have a title keyframe. Now for the title, uh, it's going to be interesting. You're going to have a custom keyframe value. And I'm again, literally, you know, just, and, and all these values, by the way, are in my GitHub repo. So if you go ahead and literally um, see the repo, you'll literally see all these values. Uh, but these are will be the values. I'll just explain the title animation and then I'll copy the rest of them because I don't want to waste too much time into explaining all these animations. But basically what happens is like animation values are from zero to hundred percent. They go from zero to hundred. So of course on the zero uh, one, which, what we basically want, we want the line height to be zero. We want the letter spacing to be of a custom value. Again, this is what Karnak, he was using these things. So I literally just use the same. I didn't actually bother to change these things, these values, uh, because it looked nice to me. And then the opacity, we want it to be zero. And at when it reaches like 25%, we again want the line height to be zero. And what I mean is by, by the way, what I actually mean is the 25% of the animations, what I'm talking about. So we have a three second duration. And as soon as it starts, so it starts at 0%, then it goes to 25%, uh, where we want the opacity again and the line had to be zero. Uh, once it actually reaches 80%, we want to uh, show the element, actually, we want to show the title. That's what we are animating in our case. So we want the opacity to be 100. And once it reaches 100%, we also want the line height to be 100%. And this is how we'll be basically getting those nice uh, text stroke uh, properties, which we added before. So now let's save this. 
Okay, let's literally uh, go back to our app and let's see if this is actually working. Let's refresh this and boom, that's like that, guys. Look at that, it looks clean now. And we also have our text stroke uh, working as uh, we meant it to work, right? You can literally again change the color of the stroke here if you want to customize this, but I want to keep it the same. And what I'm going to do at this point, since we are already inside of our tailwind config, is I'm going to get some other values as well. So I'm literally going to copy those values and literally paste them in here. And I'm just at that. And we see we have some other uh, stuff. We have some box shadow, uh, custom box shadow stuff. Uh, and again, uh, it's just naming. This is how I named it. You can literally change these names. Uh, I have some keyframes. So I have more animation. So we have fade in three. We also have a fading in animation, a bottom animation, a fade top animation. Um, and all these animations are very simple, by the way, once you know how to like do animations and stuff like that. But basically, this is these are the keyframe values I have for each of these animations. So any animation you create here, you have to have like a keyframe for that uh, to basically define a keyframe. Keyframe is just like at every single point, what do you want uh, your animation to look like? That's what a keyframe is, basically. And these are my values. So yeah, I just tweak them according to my use case. And that's literally it. Um, so we're literally gonna save this file and go back to our page CSX. Again, we have an animation here. Uh, the good part about uh, uh, Tame is really, uh, what happens once you have these animations, we literally, uh, when I hover over this, we literally see the, the custom animation which you created right over here. And the, the IntelliSense actually picks this up, our custom animation, whenever you put anything inside of Tailwind config, so which is really, really good. Um, however, it's not picking Animate Fade in 3. So let's see if that is actually uh, the right. So we do see that it is actually Fade in 3, but it's not actually picking this up. So let's try to see. Oh, yeah. No, it is. I think my name was wrong. It was Animate instead of Animate. That's the reason it wasn't picking up. So I just, just by hovering over the class name, I got to know that my, just because my class name was wrong, it wasn't actually picking up. And now it actually picks up really nicely. Um, and yeah, let's actually go back to our app now and let's check, let's refresh this. Now we see both uh, the opening animation and the newsletter one. Now if you literally want to change all this stuff, you can go ahead and change it yourself, but this is how I like it to be. Okay, over to the next step now. We have our opening animations done. Uh, what we wanna do next now is we wanna work on our newsletter form because that's literally the main component we have in our app right now. So what I'm gonna do is literally uh, go on my root, direct root directory and create a folder called components. And we're gonna be having all of our components inside of our components directory. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to page, copy the name here, and inside of my components, I'm gonna create a newsletter form tsx component so i'm using the snippet uh from um, so when i'm going to use rfce this is literally a snippet I, I like to use and this is basically an es7 snippet and you literally see this uh right over here it's by uh, it's by this guy right here uh I, I don't know how to pronounce his name but yeah this is a really popular extension you literally can use this to have these nice little snippets um, even if you want to use uh, some, let's say, a different one, you can literally say RFCE. This is the newer uh, ES7 const uh, one, but I like to use RFCE. So let's stick to that. So we have our newsletter form. All I'm going to do is I'm going to uncomment this line and literally import this from our components. And we see this nice import syntax now, uh, which happens by default inside of Next.js. So we literally want to save this. And let's go back to our app. Let's see if we see something. We, again, whenever I highlight this, we see we literally have the newsletter form, but since it's actually black, we are unable to see exactly what's going on. So what I'm going to do is go inside of newsletter form, and let's actually start building this uh, component now. So this is literally going to be our main component. All the stuff, all the brains is going to be inside of here uh, in this main big component. So we're going to start with a simple div. Inside of our div, uh, we're going to be having a form, right? And that's how we're going to be doing our submissions and stuff like that. And inside of our form, we're going to have a big div. Now, this div is going to contain the majority of our um, of our input stuff. So all of uh, this main div container is going to contain our message icon, our email, our subscribe button. So this is the stuff we want to create right now. So what I'm going to do, go back to our app. 
let's literally start working on uh, this stuff. So, uh, and actually, if it feels easier for you guys, I can literally keep it side by side by side. But I just really don't like to uh, keep it side by side. I just like it the way it, like this. Uh, but let me know, like, give me suggestions, guys, if you uh, prefer in a side by side approach. Um, I really don't like the side by side approach, so I prefer to keep it this way. But yeah, and most of you, I reckon you're actually coding along with me. So you let you guys can literally see it on your screen as well. So let's start with, with this step right now. Uh, here we're gonna be having an envelope icon, and we're gonna be using a library for this. You might be thinking, why do you have to use library for just like a single icon? It's because remember I told you guys that I'm gonna be extending this in the future maybe, so we'll probably support more icons and stuff. Um, this is the reason I decided to use hero icons. But yeah, literally you can copy an image or an SVG if you don't want to install a library. Um, so I don't really think it's an oracle, but yeah, uh, we'll be extending this uh, and at some point so our envelope icon is will be the, the icon here so i'm just going to comment this out for now um and i'm literally going to focus on the next part which is going to be our um input for our input we're going to be having a placeholder and this is literally going to say email address and what it's gonna so this input is gonna have an on change and a value property now for that to happen uh since everything by default in nextjs and the app directory is actually a server component and if you don't know what server components are please watch my previous video i literally went in detail with all this stuff like what a server component how it works and everything but literally a server component doesn't support like uh, any any uh, any stuff which is attached to a window object so like state use effects and all this kind of stuff a server component does not support that uh, however if you really want to use uh, all that stuff inside of our app uh, inside of our component what we can literally do is you can use the directory called use client to convert our server component uh, since everything by default is as a server component so we have to make sure we are using use client to convert this into a client component before using any of states or any of stuff like that so i'm literally going to create a variable for input and it's gonna be called set input, and I'm gonna be importing use state from React. Uh, there's gonna there's a reason why we wanna have these uh, input stuff, and the reason we wanna have this input here is because uh, our input field is gonna have a value tag attached to the input, and then the on change, uh, which is going to accept the e, and then it's gonna be set input. And again, basically, what I'm trying to do is literally. I'm recording what the user is actually typing in into the input field. Uh, this is what I'm doing. So I'm going to be storing my value inside of my input. So this input basically is going to be tracking all the stuff the users, uh, user will be typing. And to literally show you guys, what I can do is I can literally console log my input and go ahead here. And I'll, right now, it doesn't look pretty at all. I know it doesn't look like the finished build. But let me just open the console. Let me clear this stuff. And let's type in something like Steve. We literally see in our console, I don't know if you guys can see this, it's literally tracking what the user is typing. And yeah, this is how we you, you basically track stuff here. So yeah, using this thing called use state. So that's what we are doing. Uh, have a use state, an input, and a set input. The next thing uh, we want to do here, we also want to make sure this is a required field. Uh, we don't want the user to submit the form without ent actually entering their email. And by the way, just a little plug, guys. Um, yeah, make sure to subscribe to my email as well. Uh, if you really want to hear about uh, really good stuff, I'm going to be launching some of the stuff very, very soon. So um, that would be really cool if you guys yeah, give a subscribe because I literally have your email. And I promise you there will be no spam or anything. Uh, it will be really just useful stuff. I'll be learning all the resources I come to find. So I'll be sharing some of the really nice tricks and stuff like that. So yeah, definitely uh, subscribe if you want to. And also go ahead, follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, just a little plug in there. Um, but yeah, uh, we wanna keep it required. Also wanna make sure the type is of email. The reason uh, I'm doing type of email here, and uh, sorry, we already had a type. We don't want text. Uh, we, we see we have all these types for the input field. We want it to be email. The reason we wanna do this is because uh, by default, we have some nice typings here. So when I press enter, you guys literally see 
this is this is literally happening because we have a type of email that's the reason we get this nice uh finger that is actually missing this so it will not allow the user to submit some random stuff but it will only allow uh, uh like unique and general emails to be submitted uh next thing i want to do is the class name i want to make this pretty now so the first thing we want to do is we want to actually style also the outer container so it will all make sense. So I'm literally gonna start on with the topmost div here. And for the topmost div, we're gonna be having it as flex and flex column. We want it to be stacked on top of each other. I'm also give, uh, gonna give us a spacing between, uh, spacing of eight between each of the components. On a medium screen size, I want it to basically be restricted width of 400 pixels. I don't want it to go more than 400. I want to restrict a width of 400 pixels. That's what I, I wanna do. For the form, I'm gonna be having a custom class called newsletter form. And again, this we will, uh, we're gonna be creating inside of our global uh, CSS in just a while. I'm also gonna have some margin top of 10, and we are also gonna be having animate free and entry. And let's literally save it. This is again, we are reusing our animation uh, property which we created just a while ago. And let's go back, uh, we literally see uh, so we literally are going to see our form animating here, but of course it doesn't look that pretty. So next, our job is to make this pretty now. So this whole overall uh, div, I'm going to be styling in just a while. But before I actually style this, I'm also going to have a button right here. And for this button, uh, for for just now, uh, what I'm going to do is we're going to be having some span tags here inside of the button. I'm literally just going to copy this stuff. Again, it's all in the repo down there if you want to uh, uh speed up your workflow and copy the stuff but basically what I, what I have here inside of the button is i literally have uh, a span tag for subscribe here i i literally have another span tag right here which is having a class name of success and this basically means when our form actually goes to a submit um submit state then it's going to be a success state when we actually press enter there will be a success uh, class name here and the reason we have these classes is because we're gonna be animating these things. The next SVG, I have a, a trails SVG here. And the next thing I have is is uh, the plain uh, thing here. And for this, I literally have a div. And then I have two more divs uh, with the class name of left and right. Now you don't wanna be changing these class names here because these will be linked uh, to what we're gonna be doing in just a while. We'll be creating a lib folder and we'll be creating some utility classes uh, to literally, uh, because remember in the beginning, I, I mentioned we're going to be using GSAP animation library, right? So we're going to be using that to animate our uh, plane. So we're literally going to be animating our plane. So the plane which we have here, so whenever I press subscribe, it actually changes into this paper plane and then it actually beautifully animates. And we see these trails as well. So I don't know if you guys can literally notice this, but we see these beautiful trails as well. And this beautiful animation on the tick mark as well. So I'm gonna be animating all of these things using a SAP animation library. So I'm literally gonna go back to our Visual Studio Code and we will literally work on um, animating this stuff. Yeah. So what I'm gonna do now um, is we have these class names, we have the span tags, and we have a success, we have a trail. And we also have a plain div. This, this is basically our button. I'm literally gonna save this and actually let's see how it looks first of all. Um, right now, uh, it's because we don't have the coloring of uh, the theme setup. So we literally don't see the SVGs. Uh, but what we can do now is we can literally style, um, I think we can literally style the button or we can literally have the class names in. Um, so first thing, uh, let's actually start with styling the, the outermost div right here. Uh, so it actually makes uh, all of this makes sense. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a group. Uh, the reason why I want to do this a group because I'm going to have some hover and active classes on the children for this particular div. So I'm saying group here. Uh, next thing I want to do is want to make sure we want to say flex items, items center, and we also want to give some uh, spacing between the children of gap x of four. Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to have some padding uh, top bottom. We want to have padding left and we want to have padding right of one. The reason I have different left and right paddings uh, is because if you go to our finish build, 
we literally see we have the subscribe button inside of the input field and we don't actually have much padding here so that's the reason we don't have much padding on the right but we have some padding on the left side so this is how i did this and the rounded we're going to have a custom value for rounded here and it's going to be nine pixels so this is how you can literally use custom values inside of tailman utility classes when you put square brackets you can literally put anything here and this will act as a custom value as we can literally see here and we're going to be having a background and this is also going to be a custom value so it's going to be zero zero uh, oops zero nine zero d one one this is going to be a custom background and when you hover over the entire like the input thing we're going to be changing our background to something else i'm literally just going to copy this real quick uh, for to save some time but yeah this will be happening on hover and we're also going to have a custom shadow outline gray which we created before um, and again if you really want to look at what we created we can literally just hover over it or just go to your uh, tailwind config since there is um, this is how we created this outline gray we have an inset value and this is how you literally create shadows inside of uh, css so i just gave it a value of 1.5 pixels you can tweak this to whatever you want to uh, give the value yeah so shadow outline gray and then we also want to change this hover effect here so we want to have a hover effect here and what we want to do is we want to make sure the shadow is transparent and we actually hover over this and trust me guys it's going to look really beautiful so just stick with me and <laughs> just keep doing what i'm doing and the focus within we're going to be having this value and what the focus within means uh what it what this one basically means and i'm literally going to save this and actually show you guys um and now we can literally see but this is looking terrible i know this there's this is literally the plane uh these are the so these are the trails these are the trails which is going to happen when the plane actually flies off and there will be like trails on the back so this is for the trails this is the plane and like right now we see literally <laughs> it's looking crap but yeah of course it's going to look beautiful but we literally see, you see this is actually on the sides the, the the border thing which you see it's actually the shadow it's not the border but it's actually the shadow and as soon as i hover we see the shadow disappearing and the background color changing so and the focus within thing by the way is is basically whenever i literally focus on on my input field or anything which is inside of the on the inside of the div right whenever i focus on it i want the background color to uh, change as well so that's what i'm literally doing here the next thing we want to do is we also want to have some more stuff so i'm literally gonna uh, get this stuff and then explain you guys so we're gonna have focus within and here I'm just saying an exclamation mark. This means I want this to be important. I want to override this. So whenever I focus within, I want the shadow outline grade to be focused. So we have two shadows. One is going to be for focus. One is going to be for the, the default gray one. So you want this shadow to be applied. And we also want everything to be done smoothly. So we are giving a transition all property. Now, if we go back and look at our finished build, we literally see whenever I click on the input feed, you guys literally see how we get the border here. This is actually the shadow, it's not the border. So whenever I go outside of this, we see there's this shadow thing, which is transparent. As soon as I click on my input, it actually comes back again. So this is how we can do focus. Uh, you can We can use focus within uh, to give shadows inside of um, the children. So whenever you click anything, uh, whenever you focus on anything, inside of the div here. This is how you can uh, customize this. So that's it for our uh, main container dev. We are also gonna be having some styling for our icon. So what I wanna do is let's actually install hero icons at this point, uh, because you wanna make sure we have everything in place. So what I'm gonna do is literally open a new terminal um, and I'm just gonna use npm i hero icons and I literally use them in every single one of my builds. So it's a really beautiful icon uh, library. They're actually made, it's made by the guys over at Tailwind. So you can literally go and look at their website. You can literally search for so many icons. They have over like 292 icons. If that's not enough for you, then you can literally use any other library. There's uh, loads of them. Uh, but yeah, it really fits my use case. Looks really beautiful as well. So I'm going to stick with uh, Hero Icons.
let's go back to our build. I'm literally gonna npm install this. And how do I get these instructions? Are there everything is there on their GitHub repo? So this is the the GitHub repo Taylor Labs, um, and you literally get the instructions here on how to ins install these things. And they have two versions: a solid and an outline one, um, which we are gonna be using in our build. So we have it in our build. Close the terminal, um, and then literally uncomment this. And of course, our import is not working. So we are, I'm just gonna import it manually. And what I'm gonna do is offer my use client. So this is just a practice of mine. You want the use client uh, to be on top of our file uh, for next just to know that it's a client component. And then you wanna have all of our imports uh, like this. So I'm gonna import envelope icon from hero icons and the outline variant. So if you want it from the solid, you can literally toggle this in uh, right over here. But I want the outline variant, so um, I want to be using this one. And now we're going to be having some class names for our um, icon. So I'm literally going to paste them in here, and I'm going to explain you guys what this basically means. So these class names that we have here is very simple. By default, as I said before, uh, everything is mobile first on, on Tamen. So if I literally show you guys the finished build, um, we see whenever I go to a smaller screen, we actually don't see our icon anymore. So our icon is hidden on a smaller screen, but it actually only appears when you go on a larger screen, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm saying hidden uh, by default. And as soon as I reach a smaller screen breakpoint, which is 640 pixels, I want my icon to appear again. I'm just giving a width and a height, a text color, and then again, I'm saying if there's a group focus happening, basically, what basically group focus means is when you hover over the entire like um, the container there, that's what the group focus means. We want the icon to be text white. And when there's a group hover app happening, we want the icon to be text white as well. Uh, we want to apply some transition on the color colors only and also give some duration of 300. So just like that. We see our beautiful colors changing um, and it's literally looking really clean. Uh, the only thing we have to fix is these three things, which we're going to be fixing in just a while. All right, uh, we have our icon fixed. Uh, next thing we want to style is our input uh, field as well. So let's literally uh, work on our input field now. So for our input field, first thing we want to do is want to make sure uh, this is taking the full width because right now if I keep typing, we see uh, we're not actually taking the full width inside of the uh, the div. So I'm just literally going to say flex one. And as soon as I do that, we see that this increases uh, in, in the width and it's taking the maximum width now. We also want it to be text white, uh, text is small. I want the text to be smaller. On a smaller screen, I want the text to be base, however. And I also want uh, don't want this really ugly outline. So I'm going to remove that as well. Uh, we are going to have a custom a color for our placeholder. So I'm literally going to do placeholder and put our square brackets in right here. And I'm literally gonna give this custom color here. Again, I'm gonna use group focus and group focus within. I want the placeholder to be white. I also want the background to be transparent so I don't get the white background. And then I also want my placeholder to have some transition. So I'm gonna say transition colors. And uh, since th the reason I'm doing like this is because if I just have transition colors, that's not gonna work. And you guys might be thinking, why would that not work? Because that will work out on the, actually the input you, the user types in. So whenever the user is typing in something, that's the transition that will work on that typing stuff. But we want the transition to work on the placeholder, on the actual placeholder. So how do you do that in, inside of Tailwind? Is you just literally use the placeholder uh, this is literally the, the directive you use um, here. And you literally just say whatever style you want to put in here. So you can literally put anything here and this will literally work really nicely. And when I hover over this, we literally see these are the, like, the number of styles it's actually applying, which is really like amazing in my opinion, because if you do this with the normal CSS way, it literally sucks to do all this, to write all this styling by your own. Um, but this is like really fascinates me when I'm using Tailwind. And we have transition colors. Uh, last thing we have, we also have placeholder. 
and want to apply duration of 300 uh, to the transition. Now let's go back and let's literally look at this. Our input is actually looking amazing. We, we see beautiful. It's looking really, really clean. We type something in. Beautiful. Let's say we type something in. We type on the outside. We see that it's not uh, focused anymore. But as soon as I focus on it, it literally press tab. You literally see this highlighted in a nice way. Now all we have to do is style our our button. So that's the main thing we want to style now. Let's go back to our app and let's literally keep on working. For the button, uh, we want to give a few things here. So first of all, we're going to be having uh, we're going to be having a reference for our button. So I'm literally going to create uh, create a ref here, and I'm just going to name this a button reference, and I'm just going to copy this right over here. And the way we can create refs here inside of our application is we literally just say button ref, um, and we literally import our use ref from React. And because we are using TypeScript, um, later it's gonna error because we haven't actually provided the type for this ref. So if we literally look at button ref right now, it's just a mutable reference object of like literally now. So we, we don't wanna provide this type. We literally wanna provide a safe type here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm literally gonna put uh, open up my angle brackets. And if you're new to TypeScript, don't like freak out or don't like worry about this any of this stuff. Uh, but you're literally gonna get used to this. Uh, the reason we are doing this, we wanna provide our for, for the the type for the ref. We wanna provide an HTML button element. The reason why I'm doing that is because we are attaching this reference on to the button here. So now when I hover over this, we literally see instead of null here. Now we literally see reference object HTML button element. That's literally what we want to do. And now it's not going to error out later on. It's actually very type safe. And what this basically means is because we attached it here, it's only going to provide us with the types for only the button, which is really, really nice. Um, so that's what we wanted to do for the button. Uh, the next thing we want to do, of course, we also want to have a class name here. Um, but that will be something we'll be styling. So what I'm I'm gonna be doing is we're gonna be also having an active uh, class name. So that that is literally something we'll be applying as well later on. At this point, um, I don't want to focus on the class name. Uh, other stuff you want to do is we're also gonna be having a disable state later on, and that will be basically when there's no input, we want our button to be disabled, right? Because we don't want to submit without any input. And that's very important and we also want our button to be of type uh submit so when you press enter uh we want this nice effect happening right uh, that it actually submits the form so that's uh our beautiful button right there um next thing we want to do is we want to focus on styling our uh stuff inside of the button for that what i'm going to be doing is actually um literally Inside of our global CSS, uh, we have a bunch of styles. And if you literally check the repo, we, I have a, a bunch of styles in my repo as well. So what I've done is I have literally provided uh, some of the styles inside of my repo uh, for these things. So what I'll be doing is I literally uh, just copying these styles. And these styles, by the way, I literally didn't, uh, there are some of the styles which contain the CSS variables. So I literally didn't write them by my own. Uh, they I got them from the design which I was using on Drupal. So I literally link it down all of these resources in in the description. Uh, but however, I literally tweak these styles and according to our use case, uh, how we are using this in React. So what I'm gonna do is I'm literally gonna save some time and get all these styles um, from my repo. So I'm literally gonna get all of those styles. I literally paste them all over here and literally uh, I don't want to explain all of these styles because they're these are all of mainly the CS styles but basically what we are doing is we have some primary uh, so these are so if you know what CSS variables are again I recommend go ahead and do a Google search on what CSS variables are but they basically what they basically mean is they literally allow you to reuse the same things over and over again so for instance something like primary let's say I'm literally using primary here. I'm using primary here. I'm using primary here. So a really good problem to solve is we don't want to have like custom values here. So let's say if I had 
a, literally a custom value for primary here. For instance, I had a custom hex value here. Then I literally have to change the hex value all over my app if my app was really, really huge. And you really don't want to actually be doing that. So how we actually solve this problem inside of CSS, we create something called a CSS variable. And this is like the syntax on how you can use the variable over and over again throughout the entire app. And we literally see we're using this in a lot of different places, right? So this is actually very, very useful. So this, these are all the variables I have created. Um, it's not actually I have created. So these are already in the design, but I literally tweak them uh, according to our use case. And we have uh, some variable names for primary, primary dark. There, there's one for darkest. Uh, there's one for input placeholder. There's one put input text, border default. And we literally see how we are applying all these variables is basically if we go into the primary one, for instance, we literally see where are we applying them is inside of our newsletter form, we have a button. So what I'm doing is literally, in, I've given this a class name of newsletter form. You literally don't even have to give a class name, but the reason I have given a class name is because let's say if you have a form somewhere else as well, uh, we want to make sure to protect that form and like not uh, clash uh, both of the forms. So I've given a class name here called newsletter form. And then inside of the form, we literally have just directly inside the form, we have a button, right? So what I've done is inside the form, I have targeted the button element. And then here is where we have giving and don't be overwhelmed by all these crazy uh, variables. Again, these are just CSS, uh, some CSS variables. And we literally and uh, understand this once we implement the uh, the the logic for this inside of our code using uh, SAP animation library. But yeah, literally we have all of these CSS variables. We have some left wing, right wing, all of these things, crazy things going on. But these are, are really needed for the animation to work. And of course, we have some other stuff as well. And these are again some pseudo classes and stuff which we have given. Um, and these are for the SVGs, of course. Uh, we have some styling here. Again, it really cleans up your workflow uh, because you have all of this inside of your global uh, CSS file, uh, which is separate from your main uh, code right here. So now let's literally save and let's go back to our app and let's just really see. And as soon as I go back to our app, we see magically our app is actually changed right now. And it's looking amazing. Our button is looking amazing. We actually don't see the trails in the plane any, uh, anymore. It, it, the reason we don't actually see that is because uh, they will only happen. Of course, let's say if I try to submit this um, and if I try to press enter, we will literally see our page is actually refreshing right now. Uh, so we don't want the page to refresh. Uh, so we want to basically use something called prevent default. But the reason we don't see those, uh, those icons anymore is because they're actually hidden by default. They will only work once you actually submit this stuff. Uh, which we'll get to see in just a minute. So we see our beautiful button. However, there's a gotcha here, and the gotcha is actually that I haven't typed anything, but uh, um, my button we see we seem to be like actually it is disabled right now because if I press enter, you see we, it's not actually refreshing the page, so it's not actually submitting anything, which means the button is correctly disabled, but the styling is not actually what we what we should be seeing, right? Because on my finished app. We literally see this nice uh, styling here happening. So we un, un, until unless we literally type something in, we don't actually see. So we actually know that the button is disabled. Here we, the button is disabled, but we can't actually see this, right? So what we can do is in Tailwind we have something called disabled, um, which we could literally target inside of Tailwind. And the way we actually do that is really simple. We literally go back to our button, and on the end here. I'm going to use a class name attribute and inside of our class name, we want to make sure, first of all, uh, we want to use backticks here because we're going to be doing some string interpolation later on. Um, but right now I'm just going to use disabled. So this is the one that the attribute you can use inside of Tailwind. You can literally say disabled and you can literally put colon here. And all you have to do is there's going to be some bunch of styles. That I'm going to copy for the disabled state, which you can literally use uh to toggle literally target so whenever the button is and it only works for the button by the way because you can literally have disabled on the button you can't have disabled on uh other other tags um but how it basically well, it actually tracks this and if this is true then this disable it will apply all of these things when the button is actually disabled which is really powerful like 
And what we want to do here, we want to basically change the background and grayscale the button and also uh, tweak the opacity and also want to change the cursor to not allowed. So we get that not allowed thing. Um, and of course, we want the text to be small and on a medium screen size, we want the text to be paste. So let's go back to our app and let's literally, we can now see this in action that this is working, right? As soon as we type something in, it's not allowing us to submit anything. Now, uh, if I press enter, of course, it's refreshing the page, uh, which we don't want this to happen. But we literally see our beautiful uh, input field right over here, uh, which is working uh, very nicely, um, all, for the, all of the things. And again, you can literally go ahead and if you want to tweak it and customize it according to your own way, you can literally change all these. These three are the main colors. Basically, you want to be changing these uh, primary dark, darkest, and uh, all the purplish stuff you see in my app basically is according to my theme. So you want to be changing those colors according to your use case, and you literally have a custom deployed portfolio and just like um, so easily uh, and customize according to you. Next thing we want to work is we want to have a submission thing going on, right? Because right now when we submit, we we see this refresh happening uh, and we really wa don't want to be seeing that refresh. So what I'm going to be doing is now I'm going to have an on submit on my form. And again, I know uh, with all this server action stuff going on, um, there's like a, a thing where we shouldn't be using on submit and Next.js is basically pushing this action uh, thing where we are back to PHP now. So there's like this debate going on, but the reason I am not using the action and the server action way right in this build is because it was giving me some bugs and errors. Um, and that's literally the only reason I'm not using this. I tried this before with server actions, um, but yeah, that's that's the reason I defaulted back to on, with on submit. And this would be a good demonstration as well to teach API routes inside of Next.js. So here I'm literally gonna create a function called handle submit. And this is where all of the brains of our code will go in. And now uh, we are going to create this function called handle submit. And I'm just going to create this giant function here. Now, first thing we, we I really, really don't like is the refresh happening. So we want to disable the refresh. But how do we actually do that? And because we are using TypeScript, we can't just say, uh, so we literally can't just use E here. Uh, and receive our event because we're submitting something. So we receive an event and we literally can't just do event.prevent default like this. As the reason is because we're using TypeScript. So uh, this is not a good way to do it in TypeScript because we see this error. So it implicitly has any type and you really don't want to be putting any's anywhere because you're using TypeScript. So you really want to be getting the nice intelligence here when you press dot. So the way I like to basically, I like this really nice trick I learned. And uh, this trick basically shows you uh, how this act trick actually works is you put in E here and, and you literally put in anything here. It's not just E, but you literally put put in something here and then you open like a callback function statement here um, so that it actually becomes like a callback function. And then you literally hover over the element and you will literally get the exact type you needed here. So really neat and nice trick I like to use when I'm using TypeScript. And now we have the exact typing for this and literally uh, get the form even from React. And now watch what happens when I press dot, right? You get our nice intelligence here. And now uh, we can safely use prevent default. And let's literally save this and go back to our app and try submitting once again. And now I'm just gonna try submitting and we literally see there's no refresh happening whatsoever. Uh, however, we don't actually see our uh, animations working in right that's where the animation library comes in which we uh, want to be using so that's will be the next step now so the first thing we want to do is we actually want to get our input uh, from uh, the email so basically what we're going to get is the the email thing which we are tracking so users email so i'm going to create a new variable just like github copilot suggested so i'm going to create a variable called email and gonna, I'm going to be assigning that to our input field. And the reason I want to be doing that is because I'll be clearing my input field. So it will literally be, uh, because I'm going to be clearing my input field, I want to keep track of the input in another variable. So basically I'm just copying and in, in, in 
some another variable because I'll be clearing our input so it looks really nice. Next thing I want to do is I also want to get my button and the the way you can get your exactly your button and what I mean by the button is actually I want to get this button element exactly this button element the way we can get this is because we have a reference here what we can literally do is we can get the button ref you use the button reference and we can literally have to say dot current and this will literally give me the exact button element what i mean is actually this element so we can use this uh, for our animations later on next thing we want to do is we want to do some defensive programming here and we want to say if there's no email or if there's or or if there's no button we want to basically return and what i basically mean here is that we want to do some defensive programming like if the email is empty and i know we already we are already checking here and we're disabling it but this is another layer of uh, defensive programming which you can say and what i'm doing here is i'm just saying if literally the email is empty uh, or if there is no button element uh, we simply want to return out of our function and we don't want to proceed um, anymore uh, ahead next thing we want to do is we want to say if there is no active now this is interesting now what is actually i might be thinking what is active now active is another uh, piece of state which we'll be creating and this will be really really interesting and by default active will be false and it will only become true and we actually set it to true so right now what i'm going to be doing here is i'm just, I'm just going to say if it is not active if what I basically mean, if if it's not active, basically means if it is false. What I want to basically do is I want to set my active to true first of all. So that's what I want to do. I want to set my active uh, to true, and this is where we want to be using our animation, um, uh, just app animation libraries, and we'll be using something called two animations, uh, two sap animations, and these will be very interesting. And this this was how it was done in JavaScript, but I literally found uh, i literally installed the sap animation in react and just literally configured to work this with um, uh, react as well i'll be using two of these uh, so there literally will be two of these animations which we'll be putting in here the first one is you can literally think about it will be for the plain keyframes animation and the second one will be for the trails so when you go back to our finish build and i actually refresh this oh, sorry not refresh so I want to submit something. So let's say I submit any email. And when I press subscribe, watch what happens, right? There's a plain animation, then there's a trails animation behind that, right? So there's these two animations, the, the main animations, which we want to be focusing on, which is what we'll be building right over here. So that will be our next step. So the way we can actually now do that is we have to some, uh, install something called the SAP, first of all. And that's, uh, I don't know how, people pronounce it is like sap or uh it's actually green sock animation that's what it's called i just like to say it's sap um but yeah it's a javascript animation and they have a really nice package for react as well and you can literally see it has huge number of downloads um so all you have to do is literally say npm install and there's a guide on how to actually use all these uh things but it's a really really nice uh, package for animating stuff now i didn't uh, went too much deep into this uh, but it's enough to actually make our animations work uh, but i want to open our terminal and let's install uh, green sock animations i wonder what the full name might be uh, but yeah uh, this is the animation and we have it right installed now we want to be uh, doing some imports here so the first import we want to be doing is for our uh sap animation right here and then the next thing I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be getting uh, some properties from our animation. So I'm going to remove this console log. And what I'm going to do is from our animation. So you, this is literally just uh, uh, the, the literally a namespace. And uh, the reason I opened curly, uh, curly braces here, because this contains different things. So this will contain something called two. This contains something called context. Now, I want to be getting three things from this thing. The first one is going to be the two, and this is again, this is a function. So this will be a two function, then there will be a from two function, and then the third one will be a set function. Now, these are the three functions I want to get from our the namespace here. And these functions we can literally see 
uh, the first one it actually creates a tween. Uh, so uh, we can literally say it creates a tween going to the given values. Again, uh, I don't want to get too much into this because it's not like an animation tutorial. Uh, but yeah, this is you literally read all about this in the documentation. But this actually creates a tween. The second one creates a tween coming from. So it's from to uh, the first set of values going to the second set of values. And the third one is the set and it actually sets the properties uh, of the targets. And literally they actually show you how you can uh, do this inside of um, inside of your application right here. So we have these three values uh, coming from the SAP animation library. The next thing we wanna do is we wanna set it right over here. So the first one we wanna be doing is we want to be uh, doing for the button. And again, the first thing, it will literally tell us uh, every single thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm literally going to comment this out so people literally get this animation for planes. Um, so what I'm going to do is literally going to type in two. And again, this is a function, so I'm going to open my brackets. Now, first thing you see, we want to have a class name here. So instead of having a class name, what I'm going to do instead is because I literally got the button, so I'm just gonna put the button because I wanna target my button. That's what I wanna target, right? Next thing, we wanna open our, our object. And inside of this object, we have all these properties we can see. We have we can literally assign all of this stuff, but I wanna focus on the keyframes because uh, that's what I wanna tweak. Inside of the keyframes now, uh, we literally wanna have, and we can see keyframes can be of type object because this is how it's showing us in TypeScript. So we can literally see here, it can be a type object or it could be like variables. But what we can do here inside of keyframes now is what I have done is I have created a, a literally a function called get plain keyframes. And I've literally uh, created this function inside of my util, uh, util folder. And this will be a really nice function. And like I'll literally show you guys how this will look like. But this will be the, our main function. There will be getting all of our variables which we created before. So if you guys remember all these variables which we were using, all these CSS variables, we'll be using inside of these functions. And I literally show you guys a way how we can get these variables and uh, do them in a really nice way. So the next step I really wanna do is let's actually create our uh, utils library and let's actually add this function in. Uh, the reason I didn't actually create this function right over here is because I didn't want to like clutter our main sort of logic with too much information here. So this is a really good practice which you can follow um, whenever you have something like a utility thing going on. So on our root directory here, uh, we want to open a folder. I'm going to type in lib. Inside of our lib directory, uh, what we can do, we can literally just say uh, get plane. Um, and it was. I suppose I think it was keyframes, keyframes dot ts. So I'm not gonna say dot tsx because it's not gonna uh, it's not gonna be like a, a component, but it's just gonna be a function. It's just gonna return uh, some stuff. Now inside of this function, I'm just gonna copy paste this and literally explain you guys. Again, this is not an animation tutorial, so I don't want to waste too much time on these. So here we can see we literally have some values. Uh, so the first set of values you see we have we are receiving. So because I've created this as a function, uh, we are receiving a bunch of values. The first, which we are, uh, the first thing which we are receiving is the set function. The second one is going to be the uh, from to function, which we saw earlier. And the third one is going to be the button element, which we're going to be receiving. The fourth one is going to be set active, because remember, we're going to be setting the active to false uh, back again. And then we also need the set input. Uh, which is going to be which what we're going to be doing is we're going to be clearing our input as well after a while so i really uh so there is you literally you guys will be seeing these crazy types and if you're literally new to types you'll be freaking out what the hell is happening here why are these green crazy types and why am i doing this as the reason i actually got this because i've created this in a separate uh, lib folder um i really wanted to be type safe here and the way we can we literally the way uh, this actually works is we can literally see when we're returning this uh, get, we, we want to return, we want to make sure we return an array first of all, because keyframes, I mean, if you go here, we literally see this is an array of variables. We literally see an array of variables right here. So the, the way this actually works is we literally have these type safe values. So if I literally go ahead and um, literally um, 
use my intelligence for, for some reason it's not working right now but basically how what this actually means is uh, these these things are all type safe and when i'm using these functions anywhere so for instance when i'm using this from to function i literally um know what i'm doing so let's say yeah so you can literally see the uh, the intelligence right now so and this is happening on the from to function and the same goes for uh the other functions as well which is the set function so we literally have the type save intelligence for set functions and the way i got these types by the way are literally from the library so i literally what i did is i literally hovered over these uh, these elements and i literally got the types from here so these are the exact types i'm using here and it, you might be thinking is my why am i doing this in a separate file i could literally have done this so again it's the purpose is to keep everything clean and not have cluttered this up with uh, a lot of the random stuff which it should be going inside of a util um, folder right so i have everything uh, done here uh, very nicely and cleanly so we literally see all these things so the, the things which we are, gonna, we are returning as keyframes here is we literally see these uh, css uh, variables right over here so we're doing some custom css variables here then we have some duration and we have an on complete function now you don't have to understand everything here because these are some animation stuff going on now, whenever the, the animation completes, uh, we basically want to use our set function, which we saw earlier. And again, we want this to be happening on the button. And you want to set uh, these variables to these percentage values. Again, these are again CSS variables. And again, we have a bunch of different objects right over inside of this array. And again, these have different durations. So we start with 0 0.2, and then again, we go all our way to 0 0.5 degree, where we do the rotation of like 50 degree, so we are basically rotating our wing, our plain uh, SVG, which we had. So we're rotating that and we literally keep rotating that on different uh, keyframes. Now these are done by, uh, by an advanced designer. So we don't want to be like messing this up. And usually what will happen when you're working in, in, in a company or some situation like this is you'll be hand, handed over these designs or to you by a designer. And you will literally be just be using these designs and don't want to mess these things up. And your job is basically to connect all this stuff, right? The next, lastly, the last stuff which we have is we have a duration of 3.375. And here we, we see something unique here. Uh, inside of our on complete function, we have a set timeout going on. And inside of the set timeout, we see uh, we are removing the attribute of style. And what basically this is, is, is literally a, uh, the attribute on the button tag. And we literally want to remove style attribute. So we don't want to provide any styles. And then we have a from to function again, which we are applying on the button where we are saying the opacity needs to be zero. We have a Y value again. Uh, and this is a negative Y value. And then again, we have some other bunch of stuff, the duration. And when this actually completes, this is where we want this, these things to happen. This is the reason we had set active and set input here. We want to set the active back to false. And you might be thinking, what, is, what the hell is actually active? So the active is basically if I go back to my global CSS, if I literally search for active. So this is what active is, guys. So we literally see uh, when the newsletter form and when the button is not active, uh, we literally have a different background and this is like an active class. So we, we are basically using this active class and this might be familiar if you have literally practiced your JavaScript enough. So you might be familiar with this. Basically what we are doing is when our set active is true, we're toggling this class, and when this is not active, uh, we are toggling this uh, background color for our button. So something to note uh, for the active class name which we are using. So that's what we are doing. Again, these are again some type safety measures I took earlier, so you don't have to go and uh, get these yourselves. But this is literally uh, what um, we should be, this is literally how we should be doing this. And we have a set timeout. Again, set timeout is the time you have provided here is of 2.5 seconds. So after 2.5 seconds, basically it clears off and all of these things actually, uh, basically it's a set timeout function. So all of these things actually clear off after 2.5 seconds and we literally see our beautiful animation. So this is the function which where we are doing all this crazy stuff is it, it's basically all it is. It's basically we're returning this array here. So I literally remove this. It's just it's just an array which we are returning, and we're invoking this function inside of our newsletter form. So I'm literally invoking this function here now. 
as soon as I invoke this function, we see an error right here, right? Because it expected five arguments, but I didn't provide them. So what I'm going to do is step by step, I'm going to look at these and we need to provide the from to. We also need to um, provide these different arguments. So we have the from to. Um, the first one which we have, it shouldn't be button actually. It should be set. Uh, so that's what I did wrong. Uh, the first one is going to be set. Second one is going to be from to. The third is going to be the button element. And then it's going to be set active. Um, and remember, it's not active. It's, it's going to be the setter function which we're going to be sending. And then again, the same goes for set input. And th if this is all well and type saved, this will literally be really, really good because now we have these type saved elements going on. So let's say if I send something wrong here, let's say if I send something on input here, this will error on this actually tell me that argument of type string is not assignable. This is a TypeScript error. So we literally point it out if you're doing something wrong here, which is really clean, right? So we have this nice keyframes which we are getting back from our function. And this will literally allow the plain animation to work. And if we did this correctly, all of this correctly, this should literally work the way uh, it's supposed to be. One more thing which actually missed in, on our button was actually the active state. So on our button, uh, remember I showed you guys this active class. So this is something we wanna make sure we do. So the way I, I actually figured this out because we are using React right now. So how we can do this in React is we can literally just say, if the active is true, we want to basically say and then and we want to give our active class because you already have active class inside of global CSS, right? This is an active class. So we're going to provide the active class once the active state is true, um, which is the way we should be doing this stuff. So that if the active is not true, it'll be providing appropriate size um, accordingly. And then we have disabled, of course. So we want to save this. If we do this correctly, we should be seeing our animation for planes. So let's actually go back and let's try this out. Let me just refresh the page first of all. Let's start it and let's try this animation. So I'm literally just going to type in my email. And here we go, just like that, guys. We literally see this animation. And you see, I didn't do anything. The input cleared itself out, right? The, the, the way it actually did that is because inside of our get plane keyframes function, we're sending our set input and basically we're toggling this to uh, back to like null, back to like a string, empty string, when everything basically completes here. So when everything completes, we're literally setting this back to empty. So this is really, really nice, right? We literally see this working the way it's supposed to. As soon as I press enter, this turns into a plane and poof, the animation works really smoothly. Uh, the one thing which we are missing right now is the trails, uh, which we want to figure out. So we literally can't see the trails, the mini trails which were happening is give a slight nice touch to this uh, whole input field. So that's the thing we should be working next. And that will be another animation right over here. And I literally comment this out and I literally say, this will be the animation for the trails. And it'll be again, very simple if you guys guessed it, is we're gonna create another function here and that will be called get trails keyframe inside of the same lib folder. I'm going to create this function dot ts and this will be for the trails again i'm literally going to get uh some stuff here again the same stuff as i explained before uh, we want to be returning an array with a bunch of values again these values i literally got from the design and here we're using a function called get variable now what is this function called get variable now, this is another utility function uh which i created and this will be called get variable typescript. And this will be an interesting one, which, which I will explain just in a second. And this will be this function basically where we'll be exporting this function. And what this function will accept, it will accept a property and an element. And basically what it does, it actually uses something called get computed style. And this is a function which is built into like JavaScript. So you literally can use it get computed style. And this accepts the element and also like uh, what it does is basically you can then get the property value for that element. So you can literally get anything for that element. So this will access the element itself. So if we have like a button element, it literally access the button element and get the property values for those things. And what I mean by property value is basically if you go back to our get trails keyframes, um, if we did this correctly, 
um, we shouldn't be seeing any errors here because I think it's imported from the right directory. So let's literally get this again. And we see it's saying cannot find module uh, dot slash get var or its corresponding type declarations. Well, that's fine, but I've already declared this right over here. So not sure why it's saying it cannot actually. Okay, so is I think uh, if we just press Command Shift P and restart our TypeScript server, let's see if we still get this error because this sh we shouldn't be getting this. Yeah, sometimes your TypeScript server crashes and this usually happens. So you literally just press Command Shift P and restart your TypeScript server and all will be well. Um, I get into this uh, so many times. And you literally want to import your get trails keyframes as well. And here, we are basically just sending our button element, which we'll be using right over here inside of our get variable function. Now, you can literally clean this more up, but I literally made this in, in a really reusable way. Um, and what we are doing with the get variable function, by the way, is we are literally sending the property. So this is literally, think of it as a CSS variable we are sending. And the second one, the second argument we are sending is the button actually. What it's actually doing is getting the element and it's it's getting the computed style for that element so it could access the property value, um, which is really clean by the way, because what happens now, it will literally get the variable, the actual variable, um, and we're literally sending the the property here as well. So it's using that property right over here and it's literally getting us this variable right over here. What I basically mean, if we go into our globals and literally search for this, it literally gets us this value, which is completely mind blowing. When I, I didn't know about this before, and I literally, when I got to know about this, this is like mind blowing, right? Because it actually gets you this exact value um, just by using the CSS variable. So if you use get computer variables, this actually returns you this value. And this is like crazy powerful, right? And you literally create a function for this. So really good reusable way, reusable practice. Now we literally save this file and we don't want to mess uh, anything up. If you really want to tweak stuff, like feel free to do it. But yeah, I didn't uh, want to do that. And literally close that file, save your file over here. And let's go back and let's see if our tool animation works yet. So I'm literally going to type in my mail again and literally click on subscribe. Let's see the trail. Here we go. I don't know if you guys saw it. Um, if I maybe increase the, the duration for it, uh, you might, you guys might be able to see it. Um, I'm really not sure where I should be doing the duration thing, but if I literally increase the duration, you guys might be able to see that, but it'll be happening very slowly. Um, uh, but I don't know if you guys literally saw, so if I, I'll actually zoom in more and, and literally I'll type in my mail. We see these beautiful trails. Uh, going on the back of the plane. This is looking really nice, right? Again, these are purple because I literally tweaked them to be purple. Um, because if you go into global CSS again, uh, we have something called trails. So this is the color for your trails. So I literally made them darker. If you really want to tweak this again, you, all you have to do is change this RGB value over here and you will be good to go. So yeah. That is uh, done. So we are actually done with our animations, guys. So our animations uh, portion is actually complete. We have the beautiful animation happening, uh, but this is just the UI, right? Nothing's happening. So we can actually submit the email. Like we are actually submitting the mail, but where is it actually going, right? So it's not going anywhere. Um, it's just the UI. So now we have to connect this to our backend. So for the backend, we'll be using the MailChimp API. And all we'll be doing is literally be connecting this with our MailChimp in a nice way. When So when the user actually submits this, we have a, a post request going on here to our backend uh, where we'll be creating the API route for it. And literally submitting the email to backend, we'll, we'll be actually able to see all the emails in our MailChimp uh, accounts. Really nice. So let's actually work on that stuff now. So. Now there's going to be some interesting backend stuff going on. So what we're going to be doing, the next thing is outside of this active function. So we, we want to make sure we are actually outside of this function. We will be creating a post request here. So this will be a post request to our API. So it will be out to our local API. And 
the route will be actually called add subscription. Now I named this like add subscription. You could literally name it anything, but this is what we'll be doing uh, next here. So first thing uh, we should be doing is we should be actually going and setting up our MailChimp account. So I think it's the right time to do that. So it's really easy to set up your MailChimp account. All you have to do is literally, and what is MailChimp by the way? So uh, forgive me for not explaining what MailChimp. MailChimp is basically just an email service. Uh, it's just like SendGrid or something else. Uh, uh, if you've used it before, it basically allows you to uh, receive all the newsletter emails or anything. It could be literally anything. We literally store all your mails. And the reason we want to use something like an email service here is because uh, it has lots and lots of templates and you can literally leverage those templates and send emails to like thousands and like literally uh, thousands of people uh, all together, right? So you want to be using something like a service like MailChimp, which is really, really nice. Um, yeah, I just like found this. Uh, they're, they're typically free for a, a, a lot of like 500 contexts or so. Um, I think they probably have more uh, context. They allow you to have more context and stuff. And they have pre-built email templates, which is a really nice. Um, so they give you a lot of different features and you don't have, even have to pay for it if you really don't have to, right? So you, all you have to do is literally sign up for an account. I already did before. And once you literally sign up, you might have to tell them about your use case or something like that. So uh, in, in the beginning, they don't actually allow you this is ask some questions and you literally just have to set up. Um, but it's not that really, it's not that really, really that hard or anything, but you literally, uh, and they literally uh, reinstate your account as you see here. So first they actually revoke your status, but you literally have to explain them that you're that using this. You literally have to verify your proof, right? So you're a real person or anything. And then you literally have to uh, verify that and they uh, get, give you back your status. Then you can literally, all you have to do is the reason we have to, we're using something like MailChimp is we have like all these different features which we, we could use with our emails and with our subscribers or anything, right? Which I'll be using with you guys as well. So when you go to my audience dashboard, uh, you literally see all of your messages and every single thing. And there's a lot you can literally build with their API. So they have a really nice API, which I'll be showing you guys. But first, we can literally go on all the contacts where you can literally be able to see all your contacts. So these are all my current uh, 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 contacts. And I have over like 26 contacts, 12 of them are subscribers. And you literally see all of the all of your contact statuses. So if someone unsubscribed, I was testing this earlier, so I literally unsubscribed from, these are all my testing emails and some, some stuff. But you literally see, you can literally see the status here um, and all of this stuff, really, really nice, right? So, we will be needing two things from our MailChimp uh, API. And uh, the way we'll be setting this up is we'll just be using, uh, there's an NPM package they have. So what we'll be doing is uh, I literally go and check the NPM package, which we'll be using uh, from MailChimp. They have this a specific package going on. It's called MailChimp Marketing. So I literally type this in. Yeah, it's, oh, it's right here. Yeah, it's this one, MailChimp Marketing. So you'll be using this uh, marketing package and you can literally see Node.js, so it's for the backend. Um, it's an official Node.js client library. So we'll be literally installing this and this is how we we'll set it up inside of our backend route in Next.js. And they have a bunch of different endpoints. You literally get all these endpoints. Um, I didn't experiment with a lot of them, but yeah, they're really, really nice endpoints you can use um, to connect a lot of different things. So let's, let's actually get started with this. Uh, I'll just copy this install command. Let's go back to our code and let's set up our backend. Um, so inside of this folder, I'm just gonna install our MailChimp marketing package. And let's wait for it to install. So how we'll set this up is really easy. Uh, what we'll be doing is first of all, I'll close the terminal. And what I'll do is I'll literally go into my API folders. Now inside of the new app directory, um, we, the way you actually create API is really simple. Inside of your app directory, you literally create a folder called API. And just like with everything else, they have really nice conventions now. Uh, before we used to just create the API route and literally that's all we had to do with uh, the inside of the API directory. Now we have to follow a nice convention is where we have the route name. So that would be actually a folder, just like we follow with our pages. 
um, is the same way with the API. We create this route, so this is based on the route name. And then inside of this folder, we create a, a file called root.ts. So this has to be root.ts. And the reason, again, this is a really nice convention they have created in the newer uh, app directory, uh, which we, we can follow. And now all we have to do inside of this is we literally just have to export a function called a post function. So if you are doing a post request, all we have to do is a post function. Before we had to like literally check if it's a post request or if it's like a get request um, and so on like that. But right, right now we don't have to actually check anything. It's a post request. We literally say post. It's a get request. You can literally say get a get request. And if you have two of them, we can literally have them separately. So you're going to have post and get. And these are reserved. You can say you can think of them as reserved. So they're reserved in Nexus. So you have to make sure it's uh, capitalized like this and they're post and get like this. And, and so on uh, like that, right? They also have for put and update. So you can literally use the, the other ones as well, which is really, in my opinion, this is way, way cleaner than using something like Express or something like that, right? Um, and it's basically a Node.js server, right? So that's why it is really, really clean. Uh, so first thing that we want to do is we want to be importing some of the stuff. So I literally import some stuff here on the top. And we installed our package right here, but it's, it's giving us an error. If you hover over the error, it's actually telling us that it, it exists, but there's no types for it, right? So we literally see it, the types are not provided with the package. So we can, what we can do is we are using NPM. We literally copy this code, line of code right over here. And this, you can literally paste it over here. What this will do is allow you to install the types for the, the package as well. So you literally just um, paste this in here. We literally install the types for the marketing package. And then we see the error is gone. So we have the types now. And now the first thing we want to do here is we are actually setting our configuration. And this basically what it does, it actually sets the configuration for the API key and the access token for your MailChimp instance, which we'll be using, right? So we have to make sure we actually do this. I have added a .env.example file inside of my repo, which really nicely explains how uh, your env.local should look like. Basically, we're going to be having two things. We're going to be having an API key and a server key, uh, which we'll be doing like this. So first of all, we'll be creating an env.local because we don't want to be exposing these uh, things, right? So we're going to create our env file. So on the root, I'm just going to create .env.local. Now inside of this, we're going to be having uh, these two keys. The first one is going to be the MailChimp API key. The second one is going to be for the server. The server one is going to be look. Uh, it's going to look something like this. And I'll literally show you guys how you can get this from the MailChimp dashboard. So literally navigate to your MailChimp account. And for the API key, all you have to go uh, do is go to your settings. So you literally, um, there's a settings file here. So you literally go to the settings tab. Um, and I don't think it's the, it's the uh, website settings, but there's a tab here, uh, which I literally just used so many times. I think it's the account and billing tab. I'm, I'm really not sure again, but yeah, it's there's this some tab. Yeah, it's this account and billing tab. And then you have to make sure you go to extras and you click on extras. There's this API keys section, uh, which you want to be looking at. And inside of the API key, this will be your API key. I will be revoking this later on um, because I'll literally maybe show you guys what the API key looks like, but I'll revoke it later on and, and actually change my keys. But you can literally create a new key. Uh, let's actually do that. In fact, I'll literally create a new key and I'll just name this newsletter uh, demo YT. And this this could be like anything. So you literally could name your key anything. Then you want to make sure you copy this key of yours and go back to your account and literally paste it in here. Now the end section, which you see right over here, this is actually your API server key. So you want to make sure you put this separately like so. Um, very simple process. Um, you're going to have another, uh, more, uh, another key, which is going to be, I think it will be called MailChimp audience ID, which is going to be important as well. So you literally can have MailChimp audience ID as well. And now let's actually get back our audience ID. So we are done with our API key. 
Now for the audience ID, you want to go into your audience dashboard. Um, and inside of your audience that dashboard, uh, you want to make sure you go into your manage audience. And I think in the settings, uh, there's the audience ID, which you can get, uh, literally, um, very easily. I think this is the ID which you're looking for. I'm really sure. I'll just quickly check if this, um, uh, I'm sure if it's actually this one, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm confident it's actually this one. Yeah, it's actually this one. So you're looking for unique ID for uh, your audience. So this will be the unique ID. I think you you can literally change this. Yeah, you can change this. Uh, but yeah, this is the ID you're looking for, the unique one. So you literally want that, and you want to paste this inside of your Mailchimp audience ID. And you want to make sure these are all correct, right? Correctly configured because otherwise you your API request won't work. Um, and then you go back to your root or TypeScript and just because we added environment variables, you don't have to restart in the newer Next.js uh, way, but I just wanna be sure about uh, everything. So I literally just cut my server and restart all over again, and just refresh your app, and it should all be working. It shouldn't be messing anything up. Now you wanna be make sure you wanna work on our post request now. So inside of our post request, I'm just gonna close the terminal. Now we can literally focus on working on our nice post request. First thing we wanna do is we wanna actually get the email back, which we'll be sending over through the post request. So I think what we can do literally is literally create this one first, uh, right from here. So we know what we are doing. Uh, so inside of our newsletter form, what I'll do is I literally create a post request right over here. So what I'll do is I literally say await and I'll use fetch. So I'm just using the normal fetch API. If you're gonna use XCRS or something, uh, feel free to use that. But we'll be doing a post request to slash API slash add subscription is gonna be our uh, API route. And because I'm using await, I need to make my function asynchronous, right? So what I have to do is I have to make sure this is asynchronous uh, for this not to error out. So we have to make sure that that's true. Now the method has to be post, right? Because we're gonna be making a post request. The headers has to be defined very simply, just like content type application JSON, it's gonna be in JSON format. And then we're gonna be having the body. Now for the body, uh, I'm just gonna be stringifying because whenever you're sending something on the server, you wanna make sure you send it in a string format. So you always wanna stringify your uh, body and send it in a string format, right? And here, what I'm doing just to be safe is I'm using the stringify and I'm sending the email because that's what we'll be needing in our post request, right? Now, what I want to do is I want to basically store this in a response. And basically for that, uh, we will um, literally come back to this again and literally do that. Uh, so we can literally go back to our route now and complete our API route over here because we are working on our route. So what we can do is because we are sending the email here as the body we can literally get the email right over here and in the newer way before we used to do something called request dot body now because we see the request is actually the the fetch api request now we don't do request dot body instead now we just say request dot json and this is how we actually get the variable which we are sending um so that will be the email and i'm literally just destructuring it our request uh, because the request actually contains the email. So I'm literally just destructuring it and getting back the email right away. We can literally console log as well. Um, so we'll literally see, uh, and we should be seeing this log on our console if we did everything correctly. Um, so let's go back to our newsletter form and let's literally see if we get any emails back. So I'll just type in something here my old email i don't know why i'm using this email because uh, yeah it's actually my main email it's not like this but i'm just using i like to use the the first initials of the email but yeah let's click on subscribe and let's actually see if we see something okay great so we actually do see our email right on our console uh, console here remember you won't be able to see it on here because of course it's on the server so you'd be seeing it on your terminal inside the vs code so you literally see the mail but it's saying cannot read properties, but that's because we're not returning back anything. Uh, but we do see our email. So this means that this is all set up 
and there's no uh, there's nothing wrong in uh, our mailchimp configuration so yeah let's keep on uh, working here uh so we get back the email uh what i'm gonna do here is i'm literally gonna say if there is no email however i want to return back a response and the response is gonna be something like uh, so i'm not gonna do it like this you can literally put in anything in the response what i'm gonna do however is i'm literally gonna say something like json.stringify and i'm literally gonna send in an error saying email is required so again i'm doing another defensive stage here so if there's any empty email sent on the server you literally want to say that you have to put the email so email is required back which will be an error a response we'll be sending back now here we, I'm using a try catch block actually, and the try catch block is really interesting because it literally give us an error as soon as it, it catches the error, right? And it will not uh, um, basically it will literally return us the error. So that's really useful as well. And you want to make sure the error, the type of error is any here because it has to be like either any or it could be unknown. Um, and you have to literally provide this any or unknown. So that that's the only reason I'm putting any here. Otherwise, you won't be, and literally, you'll get to see it yourself if I don't provide the type right now. But in the try block, what we want to do is we want to have the response inside of the response. Now, here we have to use our MailChimp API, right? Now, when I press dot, we see our MailChimp, uh, MailChimp uh, stuff here, and it's actually giving us something called list. Now, this is something we want to access inside of MailChimp, and when I press dot here on the list, this is these are the num uh, amount of functions i get in the list right what do i want to do here now i want to add a list member right so we want to add a list member but whenever you want to add a list member you have to provide the list id this is where your mailchimp audience id comes in right again this is all in the documentation you literally go and refer the documentation um and i'll literally just show you guys right now you literally go here and you literally see here in the documentation if you just search for add list member um you literally will see that it will you have to provide a list id here it's right over here you have to provide a list id and literally you get an audience id so i don't know if it's the uh, is the right documentation i'm showing because it was really um nicely i saw a documentation but yeah i, I really maybe it was a blog or something i literally saw a nice uh, documentation of server they actually showed you how to use all these functions but yeah this is literally the endpoint i'm using which i which i showed you guys so that's that's exactly what i'm doing basically so i'm adding a list member and inside of this list member is where we need the process the env dot mailchimp audience id the second parameter um if you look here is going to be uh the add list member body so this is where we need to provide the body now for the body we have all these different types right but I'm only interested in providing an email address, which is coming back uh, right from our request.body, request.json. And here this is airing out because, of course, it's saying that it could be undefined. So I'm just going to put an exclamation mark here. If you really want to protect it, you can literally, on the top, you can literally just say if there is no mailchimp audience ID, just return or do something. Uh, but I'm just going to use the exclamation mark here. So we have the, the nice email address uh, right over here next thing we want to do is because uh, we have a response here what we can literally do is we can literally return this as a new response and you can literally just json.stringify uh, the response right like this which is going to work uh, really nicely again i've just done it like this um, so i've literally used like this but you can literally you don't even have to do this you can literally just say response and uh, this will literally return you back the response now for the error state, what we can do is literally, uh, for the error, we can literally return another response here. And what we can literally do for the error is return a new response and you can literally stringify. Now what I've done for the error here is I literally said that for the error, I wanna parse the error. So what I'm doing is I'm actually parsing the error dot response dot text. And this is where it will actually error, up, right? So it will actually tell you that error is of type unknown. This is the reason you have to provide a type here. For uh, and literally, you can say any or unknown, but I've just used any here in in case. And you might be seeing that I'm literally returning a, a specific type here because when this error is out, it actually returns you 
um, an error format where you have like these things. So inside of your error, you have something called response. I literally console logged this before. Um, so I literally um, got to know this, but you literally, this is the response that for the error. And what I what I was interested in, basically I was interested in, in the text. So that was literally giving me back the exact error response when I was uh, uh, getting the error here. And this is exactly what I wanted. So literally telling me what the error was about. So that that is exactly what I'm returning over here. And for now, I literally changed it back to an object as well, because this is how I did it. But you literally can, uh, you literally can just, you don't have to do this. You literally can keep this as response like this. But I literally changed it back to an object because this is how I was sending back my response. So this is our track is wrong. And that's literally all uh, we had to do for the backend. And this is our backend setup, right? Now, if this is literally set up correctly, what I'm literally going to do right now is I'm literally going to go inside of my mailship account. And let's actually go back to my all contacts. And I will type in some mails and literally see the results here. I, I don't want to delete the old ones because these are my subscribers. Actually, some of them uh, just subscribe. But what we'll be able to do is literally uh, use these mails. And literally, uh, we'll submit a mail and literally see if we get it back on our MailChimp thing, right? And if everything happens successfully, we should be getting back a response as well. Now, how do we? How will we handle that response? Is you can literally go back to our newsletter form now, and in right over here, because we are fetching it from this API and we're returning back a response, right? So if everything goes successfully, we'll be getting back a response. What we can do here is here, I could literally re record and save my response here uh, when I'm inside of the await block. So this will be returning me back in response. And here, I could literally get back the data because remember, uh, the response you'll get back, it will be in JSON format. So we literally have to do await response addition and this will literally return us back the data. Now we will have to basically be able to check the data. And if there's there's an error, uh, what we can do is we literally, and the reason I'm saying data dot error is again, if we go back to our subscription, we literally see that if there's an error, we are sending back an error object right over here. So if there's a data dot error, uh, what we can do is we literally console log the error. And if there's uh, no error, that means of course there's no error and everything was successful. We literally console log the data over here. And here, uh, before we do anything, we literally return back outside of the function. We'll li literally return if there's an error, we'll console log the error and we'll literally return. We won't be proceeding over here. But if there's no error, we'll literally be console logging our data. So that is a really a nice way to do this. So now um, I think what we can do is we can literally try this out on ourselves and we'll literally be able to see uh, something on our console. So I literally open up my console and let's type in a mail and let's literally see. So I'll just type in a random mail. I'll just type in Bruce Wayne at gmail.com. Now let's let's hit subscribe and let's see what happens, right? So you literally see an email and you get back a response. Okay, you get back a response. It's of type error. All right, it's of type error. So we literally see uh, that the status is required and serious if new can be used instead of adding or updating. So we are, it seems you're missing something, right? So we actually messed something up. Um, now, what did we actually mess up, right? So let's see, we actually messed something up. Okay, so it's actually telling us that inside of our API route, so if you go back to our API routes, what we messed up is that it's actually telling us, we literally look at the error saying, as the status is required, you did provide the email, but didn't actually provide the status in the API route. And what this basically means is they're actually not providing the, so they're actually providing an optional type for this, which is bad, honestly, because if the status was really required, this shouldn't be optional. And this should actually quote me out here, but instead it's an error. It's actually telling us in, in the error. So this, this, someone could literally go ahead and do this. And literally, this this should be an this shouldn't be an optional type. Uh, to be fairly honest, here, right? Now here, this is interesting. This is what we missed, right? 
So we want to make sure we provide a status here. And the status for this guy would be subscribe, right? Because this is what the guy is doing. He's actually subscribing to our newsletter. So I literally say subscribe and we will save over here. So this is something which I actually missed. And let's try this again. Let me refresh this. And now let's literally try this all over again. And let's see what type of response we get back. Let's show you submit this. Yeah, here we go. We get back the response. Beautiful. Here we go, guys. And literally, this will show us the status of subscribe. So this guy called Bruce at gmail.com literally just subscribed to my newsletter. And now we see all these different properties. You can literally provide more stuff here. Um, so as I mentioned before, if you go back here, um, and in this exact section, we have different stuff. So uh, we have email, we have status. I also think we have name and uh, other stuff like that. So we have a bunch of stuff we could provide to literally have all these stuff, uh, all these things in. But for, for this bill, for the simplicity, I'm just providing uh, the email because that's what we want. Uh, but now let's go back to our dashboard and let's actually see if we have any field with Bruce Wayne, right? Because that's the guy who subscribed. First of all, we should have one more and we have 13 subscribers now before it was just 12. And here we go, just on the top, just like that, we have Bruce Wayne. We have a rating field as well. We have some bunch of stuff here. So we literally have this guy, I literally click on it and we don't have the location and other stuff, but we literally have this guy's email. And yeah, that's, that's exactly what we wanted, right? We have the timings, we have everything. So this is what we wanted. So we, this means that our app is correctly configured and it also showed us an error. It caught an error and actually showed us um, that we had to provide the status. That means the, the error, is all, error is also working nicely. So this is here, our backend is actually integrated nicely. Now, how do we actually in like literally update the UI to match all the stuff? Because in the finished build, we literally see here whenever I type something in. So if if a guy who's already subscribed, let's say, um, we don't want to show him that he subscribed, resubscribed again, but instead we actually show him that he's already subscribed to the wait list and we'll let him know uh, when we launch. But if there's a new person subscribed, then we literally just show them uh, a different message. So how do we actually make it look like that now? Now, let's go back to our build. Uh, so we have configured our routes, our routes are done. Everything's gonna be happening here now, inside of our newsletter form. Now, we're gonna be like setting some states here to make sure that this happens. And the way we can actually do that is I've used two pieces of state um, and those two pieces of states is like success message and error message. I'm literally going to copy them. So I've created two more pieces of state. Uh, the first one is called success message state. And the second one is for the error message state. Uh, again, you guys guess that error message is going to be for any errors, uh, if you face any. And the success messages uh, state is going to be for any success. Message. Now I'm giving a type here called member success response. Because that's exactly the response I'm getting back on my console, uh, which I literally showed you guys before. So I literally, this whole response here is actually of type member success response. And this is something which I have custom created. So they didn't have a nice, so they did have a type here, but they weren't exporting this, uh, the mail shame API. So what I did is I created on my own, in my own custom way. Uh, because what was happening is if I literally search through this, um, first of all, it's not actually showing me in their uh, the sense, but basically what I mean is like, if I go and literally to the root and literally add list, if I hover over this, we see this returns you something called a member success response here, right? So literally control click in this, control click here, and this is how I basically look at types, right? We see we have an interface here. If I control click here, we literally go to a random index or uh, type script file, and this is the interface I got, right? So this is what I copied here. Uh, and, but they were not exporting this, so we can't actually use this, right? Um, so what I did is on my root directory, we have to create a file called typings.d.typescript. And literally inside of your typings file, uh, I had this interface. Um, again, it's not actually getting all the types from the, the success response, but it's getting the, the ones which we actually need, right? So these, the ones we actually need is will be just email actually. We don't need all of them, but yeah, you can literally, I just literally copied their interface uh, typings. And this is how I got the type back, right? Now inside of a newsletter form, 
our success message is actually type C, which is really clean, right? Now, what we want to do for our newsletter form, the next thing we want to do inside of our data.error, that's the first thing. What we want to do is once we get an error, we don't want to console log it, but instead we want to set an error message. Now, this error message, uh, uh, the reason the, the error message, what I'm setting is actually, um, there could be like literally just two types of error messages is that the first one, if you're getting an error, um, it could be uh, this error, you are already subscribed because that's the, and this literally the error you will be getting. And the second one uh, it would be, uh, sorry, the second one, what I'm doing here is I'm actually setting my success message to undefined. The reason we are doing this is because uh, if you have an error, our success message state should be cleared out, right? We don't want anything in our success because there shouldn't be any success message if we get in, uh, in any errors, right? Um, the next one here, uh, if there's no error, however, what we want to do here is we want to set our success message um, and we want to set it to data.response because remember there was a dot .response object in our Chrome just like this. So this was the object and the object contained the response. So this is how we can do this. And if you really want to clean this up, we can literally just um, we literally just in our root again, as I showed you guys before, uh, literally just clean this to response and or, or name this something else if you want to. But I'm just gonna keep it like this because it was uh, I did it like that. And the next thing we want to do here, because we are setting the success message to be the other response, we want to make sure we actually empty our error message because if there's no error, then we want to. Uh, empty our error message state as well. That's literally what I want to do. So we have a nice state management going on and you might be wondering why I'm, am I not using just one state variable for this instead of like two different state variables. The reason I'm doing that is because both these state variables are going to have different UI uh, things happening in there. So it makes more sense like to do it like this instead of just having one single message state variable. Um, so yeah, I just found this one more flexible uh, to use. And here, the error message, um, the reason I'm putting this generic error message is because right now, uh, we were facing an, a status error message, uh, but right, like after I put the status back in the root, we are, the only error we'll be facing is will be this error called, you are already subscribed. And since I didn't want to get into uh, much detail in this and uh, show a generic different sort of error, so I literally just, um, I'm just showing uh, this thing, but if we literally just console log the error, we'll be able to see this as well. So what I'll do is I literally just, um, before even, even setting this, I will actually, instead of doing this, what I'll do is I literally set this to the data.error so we'll be able to see uh, what the, the message will be. So we'll be actually able to see that. So yeah, that's, uh, that will be our error message. And I'll literally show you guys what error message we'll get when we actually submit the same emails, right? Um, so we can literally, I'll show you guys what happens then. So um, now what we can do is we'll literally uh, go back to our Google Chrome and literally let's submit the same email uh, we submit just a while ago. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll just console log our error message so I can literally show you guys what will happen uh, once I submit the same exact email. Um, so we can literally change the error message right over there. So if I submit the same email and let's subscribe and we literally get the error message and it's actually uh, giving us the title. The title says member exists. There's a detail and the detail is what it actually says. It's already a list member. You put to insert or update list members. So what we have to do is basically it's telling us that he's already a member of your list, right? Um, so the member actually already exists and it also give, it gives you an instance ID, which is really nice, right? So this is the reason I wasn't basically uh, displaying this because if you display something like um, the detail like this, it's not a good idea to show this in the UI. So instead, what I was doing here is I literally changed this error message uh, to my custom error message, which is of hey, you are already subscribed. But if you want to make more advanced error handling, uh, basically it should be like, it should be getting the type of errors. Like for instance, the instance would be, I would say a good way to get the type of error. So what type of error it is, what instance of the error it is, and you literally show them appropriate error messages, so on like that. But I literally went ahead and did this. 
Um, so that's the, the thing we want to do. The next thing we want to do is we want to display these things in the UI. So how do we actually do that? Now, that will be the, our next step here after the button here. So outside of the form, uh, we will have a div. Basically, we'll create a div here. And this div, I'm basically using a trick here. And I'm making this relative because inside of this div, I'll have another div which will be absolutely positioned um, inside of this uh, current div, which would be uh, really nice. Uh, so this is a neat trick I'm using. So inside of this here, what I'll do is I'll literally use a condition called if there's a success message or if there's an error message, I literally put these two in brackets. Um, so if either of these uh, things are true, I basically want to have my main div here. So if either of these things are true, so either if you have a success message or if you have an error message, I want this, this, the, uh, this div to be true. And now inside of this div, we're going to have another div, which is going to be for the check icon. So I literally just literally copy this one uh, and we'll build the rest of the UI. And this will be the check icon. Uh, we literally get this from the solid variant of hero icons. And yeah, we are using more icons than just one icon. I thought I was just using one icon, but we literally are using a closing icon and also a check icon. So it makes sense to have like a package uh, like hero icons. So inside of here, you literally see that we have a check icon. So if uh, this check icon is gonna literally just be for the UI, just have some height and width, and I'm just saying flex shrink zero to make sure it doesn't shrink um, uh, or do some, uh, some of that stuff. Um, but that's the check icon outside of this div here. I'm going to have another div, and this will be the main one for the messages. It will literally have a P tag for the success message um, and for the error message. So what I'll, what we'll basically do here is inside of this div, what I'll do is I'll see if our success message state is true, we want to show and display a P tag. Um, and this will be uh, basically, so I'm just going to remove this. I'll, I'll just say uh, subscribed for now. And I'll literally change this, but if the success message is true, I'll literally say subscribe. If this is not true, it's going to have another P tag, sort of. And this will literally say you are already subscribed. So you're already subscribed or something like that, right? Um, so that's what we're going to be seeing. If there's a success message, we'll literally say subscribe. If, um, if there's no success message, it literally say you are already subscribed to our wait list. And outside of this div, we are also going to have an X mark icon to actually uh, be able to close um, close this uh, close this uh, the pop up which comes up and literally have a function called dismiss messages. And we'll literally go ahead and create this right now. It'll be very simple. And I, if you guys guessed it, what we're going to be doing inside of this function. It will be something very simple. What we'll be doing is we'll literally be saying set success message to undefined and set error message to be empty. What this will actually do is literally because this div is only triggering based on either of this is true. So if we set this to empty, this will literally uh, be gone, right? So really nice. Uh, and this is, of course, the, the cross icon. And if you go back right now, we literally see it. Uh, because right now we didn't, re I didn't refresh the page, so we literally see our tick mark and the cross icon. And again, if I literally highlight this, we literally see you are already subscribed, but it's black, so we can't actually see that. So we literally work on the styling now. Um, is on this div here, the main div here. We literally see a text of extra small, and on a smaller screen, we want the text to be small, and we also want to give some sort of coloring to this. I literally get the color. Uh, and this will be of 4B4C52. If you go back right now, I think you should be able to see this. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's telling us that you're already subscribed. Let's say if I refresh this page. And let's say if I type in my mail, we should already subscribe. Because I've typed this a thousand times. <laughs> so it's literally telling me you're already subscribed, um, which is really nice, right? Which means this. Actually, the success message isn't true, so it's actually showing me you are already subscribed right now. So the next thing we should be working on is actually making this pretty, right? It's not looking that pretty right now. So we are, of course, missing the main piece of styling over here. So what I'm going to do is for our main surrounding dev, 
I'm going to give some signs. So I'm going to make sure it's flex. The items should be start. So I'm saying start instead of center. I want them to start from the beginning. I want some uh, spacing between them and there would be a custom color of 0, A, 0, E, 1, 2. The shadow would be outline gray. It's not going to be focused. It's just going to be outline gray. Text would be white and we'll have a custom rounded value of 9 pixels. And literally see if I have this correctly. All right. So we will literally have nine pixels right over here. And the next thing we want to do is you also want to have PY uh, vertical padding of four, horizontal padding of six. You also want to have animate fade bottom. Here we are going to be using animate bottom, uh, fade bottom. This is something which I tweaked and I created on my own. So this one. It's very simple. All, all it does is basically uh, animates the, the pop-up and it actually basically animates from the top and then goes to and fades on the bottom, right? So really nice animate fade a bottom animation. And lastly, we're going to make this absolute. Uh, the reason I'm doing this absolute is it actually sticks to that container, right? It doesn't actually, so there's no layout shift happening. As so like the, the stuff, the content is not moving up and down. This is the reason I use this nice trick uh, to make the container relative and to make this one absolute, right? We have the main div going on here. So I have made this absolute completely beautiful. Uh, we have this one style as well. Next thing uh, we should be working on. So if we literally go back and see this, oh, wow, this actually looks really clean, but something is still missing. So I click on the cross, uh, this one disappears. So that's also working. Let's submit this again. You see, you literally see the beautiful animation happening. So that's also working. That is really nice. Um, however, it's not actually taking the full uh, space here. So that's the only thing which we have to fix here. And I think that's uh, the reason that is, that should be happening is I think because we're probably not providing uh the width full somewhere so we might have missed the full width somewhere so i might have missed yeah so i think this is the div we need to work on and provide some classes here so first of all uh what we can do here inside of this div here is we literally i'll be changing this whole thing so how i'll be changing this it would be very simple so i literally just change this thing so if success message is true the p tag will look something like this so this APOS thing which you see here is really nice. It's an entity which we can use for something like we have. So for instance, if you want to say something like this, because since this is like reserved, like this is like a reserved thing instead of um, your code. So you shouldn't be using like something like code to quotations like this. Instead, you should be using legal entities. Um, so you should be using entities in HTML. So there are different ones. You can literally, uh, the, for this one, the, the tick, the quotation which I'm using, I'm using APOS. But literally, there are different entities you can look in, into HTML uh, just to make it more clean. Then you have the span tag for the success message. And here, you can literally see I'm accessing success message email address. I'm literally getting the email address from the success message. And if there's no success message, we're literally just saying that you're already subscribed. Please uh, be patient, right? And now we literally see this is taking the full width and it's looking really, really nice and clean, right? So let's say I try to pick up a mail, um, which isn't the part. So I'll just say Bruce, for instance, and at the gmail.com. Let's try to submit this and we literally see a beautiful animation happening. And this whole thing, uh, we have added Bruce to our waitlist. It'll let you know when we launch, right? Really, really clean. Now, if I type this over again, uh this shouldn't show me the same exact message instead this will be changed to you are already added to our wristlet very clean right really really nice user experience so i think we are almost done and this is i think this is literally this was the end of the bill i'd say and it's, it's not the end sorry so we still have uh more things to do we have i think the seo which i'll be showing uh but yeah we also have the, this beautiful nice social icons which will be really clean as well right but yeah literally we have the functionality the main core functionality or backend integrated 
So really nicely and cleanly um, working all these things, right? It's, and it's looking beautiful. So I literally removed the console log because we don't want any console logs in our code. But yeah, it's literally looking really beautiful. In the end, we're also going to deploy this uh, to Vercel. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's that's all. We'll be, do, we'll be doing all this stuff, right? And it looks really, really clean. Yeah. So the next thing right now, I think we are done with our newsletter form. I think we have concluded this. We have actually completed our newsletter form. So this component is actually done. This was the most uh, sophisticated one where we had a lot of util functions like get plain keyframes, trail screen frames, and we really made it clean and really easy to understand everything. Next thing, we're literally gonna navigate back to our page and we have a socials component right over here. Now we have to build the socials, right? This will be a very easy component. So I literally copy the name and go to our socials. Oops, change this back to .tsx and literally use my snippet RSCE and literally import this from socials. Now, uh, this will be a very neat and nice component we'll be creating. Um, it'll be really easy as well. Uh, there will not be, we're not gonna be doing some really fancy stuff here, but yeah, this will be a really nice component and we will be also creating a constants, uh, constants file for our socials uh, to be in. So what I'll do is we'll be mapping through a, a bunch of social stuff, right? So I just have two stuff, but you literally can have all of your social links right over here. And I just create this nice subtle effect when you hover over this actually shows you these nice borders. I didn't go really fancy with this, but you can literally go uh, really, really fancy. I just wanted to keep it really nice and simple, right? So I literally um, can do like something like this. Um, so yeah, let's actually uh, keep working on the socials. First thing we want to do inside of the div here is we want to map through some of the socials and we literally want to create them. So what I have done basically is on my root, I have created a file called constants dot ts and this is a very nice file right inside of this file i have a bunch of stuff going on which i'll be explaining later on um but for now we'll just have socials we'll literally export a, an array of socials and we literally have i literally have two objects the first one and i just provided some ids to have unique key values and i have a name i have a url i have a handle for them you, you can literally tweak this on for yourselves and I have these little, uh, this nice array. Now I'm literally gonna navigate back to my socials. Inside of my socials, I'm literally gonna import this from socials, uh, my constants file, and literally map through each of my social. Um, and this is just basically looping through all of my socials. And what I'll do is I'll display a div. And because we are mapping, we wanna make sure we render a key, right? So the key is gonna be the ID, which I provided in the socials, right? Now, here inside of my dev, uh, we're going to be styling this as well, of course. And we are going to be, again, we're going to be using a package called React Social Icons. Now, if you really don't want to use a package here, you can literally get the social icons from um, as an image or an SVG or just use any other icon manager. I really don't care. But yeah, we'll be using React Social Icons. So I, what I'll do, I'll literally install this. Install this package using NPM. <laughs> and we'll literally uh, say npm install React Social Icons. And this way, we'll actually install our package. Now, I could literally uh, get my React Social Icons, each of my social icons from React Social Icon. And what I'll do here is I'll literally render out a social icon with some properties in here. The reason I like to use this package is because it really uh, nicely blends in and you just have to pass a URL. And just based on the URL from where it's actually coming from, like which social media it's coming from, it changes the the actual, like the, the icon for that, uh, which is really nice and I kind of like that. So you really wanna look uh, more into this package, like you can literally type, type this in Google and literally just go to the NPM site. I think it's this side. Literally, literally they have loads of social icons. So literally look at them uh, all over here. But yeah, I really like this uh, package a lot. Let's go back and let's keep on working. So literally have a social icon. 
if we go back, we see our Twitter and Instagram are just uh, being rendered like this, uh, just based on the URL, which is really clean. Next thing, we're going to have a div here, and we're going to have two p-tags. Uh, the first one is going to contain the social uh, dot name. The second one is going to contain the handle. Really, really easy and simple, right? Uh, again, we want to style them to make sure we literally see them. So let's actually start from our main container dev, which is gonna be of flex, and it's gonna have items vertically in the center, or horizontally in the center on a smaller screen size. We wanna make sure we have some sort of gapping going on. Um, and by the way, the whole website is completely responsive. So even if you look on a phone, it's gonna look really, really beautiful as well. And we're gonna have some margin top, and on a medium screen size, we wanna have a width of 400 pixels. Um, again, this is what we're going to be doing. So to make sure it actually works nicely with our uh, all of our containers, so we have our width. Next thing we want to do is we want to actually style this div over here. And you can, again, refactor this into a mini component if you want to. Uh, but I just want to keep it like this. So this will be flex items center, justify center. Uh, we want to make sure we give it flex one so it takes the maximum space. Again, I'm going to use the nice animation uh, class of fade in of free cursor pointer. Uh, we also want to use group. Um, and then on a medium screen, we want to make sure we are hover, shadow. Um, and also, sorry, uh, on a medium screen, we want to have a hover effect. And then uh, we want to basically have a shadow of outline gray. So, how I'm actually doing this is I'm just saying, I only want to have this outline gray uh, effect happening on hover, but only on a medium screen. So I don't want it on a phone screen, right? So this is how you can do something like this. You literally stack this together. So me medium, this, this basically, this is how it looks like. There's a media query that only happens on 768 pixels. Now, the next thing you want to do is you also want to have some rounded effects going on. So rounded nine pixels. And then the overall padding should be five on a medium screen size should be 10, some transition going on. So it doesn't look very snappy duration of 200 and ease out. I literally just save this. And if you go back and if I hover over this, you literally see this, the, the beautiful uh, border here, right? That's, the, that's actually the shadow happening. Next thing we want to style is our container div right over here. And this will be text of extra small on a smaller screen size. This will be text of small, some sort of spacing between the elements of one. The first uh, class name for the P tag, we're going to be having some text and some uh, group power effects. I literally just get get uh, the styling for these two elements and literally just paste in here. So it just have some text. And when you hover, remember when we give a uh, group here somewhere, I think we give group um, somewhere over there. So I'm literally not sure where I give it. Oh, it's on the main container div right over here. So when you hover over this container div, what's going to happen is the name is going to become white and there's going to be a transition happening. And of course, I give some font uh, boldness here. Looks really, really clean to the eyes, right? And it looks really nice as well. It doesn't hurt anyone's eyes. So yeah, if you really want to have more, uh, by the way, more, or you literally want to change your socials, all you have to do is go back to your constants file and literally just change these values. That's all you have to do. And this will reflect it all over here, right? Again, if you go back to a smaller screen, we literally see it looks really nicely. Uh, everything gets smaller and fits in amazingly, right? So that's really, really nice. The next thing, I think we're done with our socials. So we have completed our socials. The next thing, we want to come back to our page. And now, the final thing which you have to do, guys, which is actually the SEO, uh, which you have to figure out. And the SEO is really, really crucially important, if, especially if you're making your portfolio website or something like newsletter or something like any of your personal branding thing. Because you want to make sure that actually comes on the uh, rankings in Google, right? So whenever someone searches for a name or anything like that, it should be on the top on, on Google, right? So I got a really, really nice score. It's because we are using the latest and greatest Next.js app directory and stuff, and they come with a lot of nice benefits. So 
just by going to the Nextjs website, I'll literally uh, be able to show you guys a lot of the benefits of the new metadata API in which they are using. So I literally go to metadata, and this is really really good. Uh, the new metadata API which they are using, and there's a few ways you can literally add these metadata tags. And there's something called Open Graph. Um, so if you know about Open Graph, what is actually you literally if you search for what is Open Graph meta tags, if you literally search for this, you literally know what these tags are. And basically, what these things are, they're, uh, they this is this is what actually con controls how your URLs are displayed on. So it's basically like uh, that. It allows Google to crawl onto your uh, website and description and all these different tags which Open Graph has. And Next.js has made this way, way easy to integrate. So all you have to do is basically, you just literally, um, Open Graph, all you have to do is uh, literally search for this. You literally see inside of your metadata, uh, which is like a, which is an object, right? It's simply an object. You literally pass this Open Graph field in and they have a bunch of different stuff. Now I have done this in a really, really nice manner. And I'll literally uh, show you guys how I've done this. So usually, where do you actually add the metadata in? If I go back to my VS Code, usually you do this in the layout uh, of your, and it's by default, you can literally see they have some metadata stuff going on here. So usually it's in the layout. And the way I have actually done this is I made this really, really clean. And instead of having this thing here, what I've done is I've literally created a different uh, I've created a different file. So instead of instead of my constants, I'm actually saving all the metadata um, instead of like uh, cluttering all of this layout up because your layout should be really, really simple. It shouldn't be having a lot of different metadata stuff. And so I've literally created a separate file for this. But for now, I literally show you guys how this works. So first of all, what I'll do is we don't get our nice intelligence for the metadata, right? So what I'll actually do is I'll literally uh, go ahead and provide the metadata type here. And next yes, and you can literally get it from next. And now if I literally uh, press command space, I'll literally show you guys these nice intelligence we get. So these are all the things we can literally get from the metadata. And I was literally talking about open graph here. So this is like literally the open graph thing which you get here. And if you press command space, you'll literally be able to get all the fields uh, right over here. So this is exactly what we'll be figuring out. So the first thing we'll be setting here is it will be our title now we want to make sure the title of course it resembles our website so in my case it will be uh love with jennifer so this will be my title and for the description i just have a custom description set up here so what i have set up here is basically just something like this and just if i change this and if i literally just remove this and just literally just these two things if i change go back to my website if I uh, refresh this, uh, you literally see the title is changed to in love with Jennifer. You don't see the description here, but you will literally, if you literally just uh, go to the elements here and literally um, open your inspect tools, you'll be able to see everything inside of your head. You'll be able to see the title and the description here as the matter tag. Really, really clean. So next year has made this super easy. Um, and of course, uh, these are not the only tags. I have a bunch of stuff going on here, which I'll be explaining. Uh, but yeah, really, really beneficial for getting a really good SEO score. Um, so what I have done basically is in, I've created a separate a separate constant file, which I showed you guys before, where we had these socials. So inside of the same file, what I'm actually doing is I'm also exporting something called a metadata. Now. I'm also exporting this metadata. Now I've also created these title and description and image fields, and I'll literally show you guys uh, what I mean by them. Is I literally created these three variables because these are all constant variables. Um, and if I change them once, I want to change uh, them over and uh, again for all these different fields. So we literally see we have a title inside of Open Graph, we have a description, we have a URL, we have a site name, we have images, and I just want to get this from Next as well. And we have something called robots, Twitter. So we have a bunch of stuff going on here. Now all these stuff are there in the documentation. I literally got them from the next year's documentation. Um, and you literally see them all these. And if, these this is all the stuff literally you want to add for your really really nice performant SEO rating, right? 
I'm gonna add all this stuff really nicely. And literally that this is all you basically need for your metadata. And then what I've actually what I basically did is I literally um inside of here, and by the way, you can change the fonts as well. Uh, if you really want to, I, I didn't bother to change fonts because I literally showed uh, how to change fonts in my previous video. Um, and I like inter quite a lot as well. So I didn't bother to change this one. Uh, but how I did this is I literally just, instead of having this, I literally just imported this function. Uh, sorry, uh, not the function, the object from the constants file. And and made this file just, as, just with a single line of code, we have the metadata in here. And the reason I provided this metadata is actually it's actually nicely type saved and it literally catches me if there's any errors or anything like that. Really clean way uh, to add your metadata in, right? And I quite like this approach as well. So you have a title, description, and all this stuff, which I've already assigned. The image is basically my personal image. So it's actually the, the image I got from YouTube. So I literally got this image uh, from my YouTube channel. Um, if you want to use your image, feel free to use your image. And in my finish, when you might be seeing something called a fab icon here, so this is something called an image on your header, like in your head thing, right? This is like a fab icon. And I, it's not changed for me in the, in, in the build right now, but it's actually changed for me on, and this is something like a fab icon, which I have actually added. It's very simple how you add this. You basically just have a fab icon file. And make sure you have that file inside of your app directory. So you see, we just have a Vercel one right now. And if I literally replace this uh, with with my one, I literally get my one here. I literally replace the Vercel one with my one. And I, right now, you can see I literally replace this, right? So really clean. And I literally have the, the fab icon now. So now I'll just, uh, what I'll do, I'll literally just, uh, get back to my terminal here and literally just try to um oh i literally can't access the zoom out property but anyways uh what i wanted to show you guys is the fab icon now i hope you guys can see is literally changed and if i literally save everything that's all you have to do to add your fab icon you go back to chrome and if i refresh this literally see exactly identical right so it's, it looks exactly like uh, my finished build now. So this is how you can add Favicon. And the reason you want to make sure you uh, want to add into your uh, the Favicon inside the app directory is because the next year's for, uh, will literally pick this up and literally add uh, a lot of different stuff. And so if you literally search here and look in the documentation, you literally see that next year's will evaluate the file and automatically add the appropriate tags to your app's head element really really useful so you don't even have to do anything on your like on your own end literally add this into the app directory and this will literally evaluate it uh, on itself really really nice and clean right and that's literally it honestly that's literally it i know it was quite a lot to take in um but yeah i mean i really wanted to show the seo portion because with the app directory and server components um it's really nice the seo is really really good you don't even have to go ahead and configure much on your end. You literally have to add some really nice SEO tags. Another thing which I would recommend for anyone who's using this also on the SEO side to also add like a sitemap uh, for their uh, for their website. And if you don't know about sitemaps, go ahead and search sitemap on Nextjs. And literally, it's so easy how you can generate sitemaps. Um, I didn't bother to end and add the sitemaps into this one. Uh, sorry guys, uh, my AirPods just stopped working. Um, the battery just died. But yeah, uh, for the sitemaps, you literally can just go ahead and generate a sitemap if uh, you want more performant SEO. Um, but yeah, that's literally it for this build. And yeah, um, we did this one. Uh, for deploying this build, actually, it's really simple. Um, I don't want to uh, waste too much time into deploying. But it's really, really simple how you can deploy if uh, you saw my previous video using the Vercel CLI. So if you don't have the Vercel CLI installed, just go ahead and type in Vercel CLI. Uh, I think you just, even if you just type Vercel CLI, you literally go to the first link you, you find. And all you have to do is install it globally. Once you install this globally, all you literally have to do is very simple. You go back to your code and you just type in Vercel. 
that's literally that's all you do and you literally set up and deploy uh, this app so you just want to press enter and there's an update available so you can also update that but yeah i want to uh, deploy this to my personal account so i'm just going to select that link to existing project right so i don't have any existing project so i'm just going to say no i want to keep this name as default uh, it's located in the current directory and this is that's literally it you have to do to deploy this you want to modify these settings uh you don't want to modify these settings um and then it's literally gonna uh, deploy this to the url um the first time you deploy this this might fail and it's because you don't have actually the environment variable set up so what you can do is literally click on this link and open this in your inspect tool so you'll literally be able to inspect this up and then what you can do is literally you literally have to select your project and go into your settings once you go into your settings, make sure you go into your environment variables and then go back to your code. Literally go navigate to your env.local, literally copy the whole file. Don't copy uh, each and every variable just by one line. Just copy the entire file uh, by pressing command A and then literally go here into the first key and literally press command V. And literally it will populate all the fields for you. And now all you have to do is select all these, uh, make sure you have this all selected. And you literally save this and you literally can select uh, custom branches and any other branches you you really want to uh, select here uh, if you have created some development branch or main branch or anything but you literally it will populate all the env variables for you um, and then you have to go and check your deployments now it is ready for you but this this isn't going to work trust me because the environment variables weren't set up so what you should do is you should really uh, redeploy this once once again and then uh, wait for the redeployment uh, to finish and then everything would be integrated nicely with your MailChimp API key um, and it will all uh, work really really nicely so let's actually wait for this deployment status let's wait for the let's wait for it to deploy and that's it that's literally it we'll be able we would have deployed this beautiful app uh, in just a I, I wouldn't say it's, it took us like a couple of minutes. It took us a time, but yeah, I was explaining a lot of different things, but it's really like like easy and it's really, it's not that difficult to set up a newsletter on your own. And especially now you could extend this with your portfolio website uh, and something really, really nice. It has these nice animations going on, the plain animation, the, the beautiful title animation. I really love the UI. And just like that, it's ready. Now you want to make sure you navigate to this main URL. Uh, this is the main domain you should be having. And now we will have our app deployed to an actual URL. Now, of course, I got some hosting for it because I wanted this to be on a .com domain with my personal name. So I literally got it just like I, I got it for like 10 bucks uh, for like a full air on Hostinger. So if you really want to get a domain set up, uh, it's really, really easy also how do you how you set it up you could literally reach me out if you want to know how i did it but it's really easy to set it up but let's actually test this out uh let's try to test some other emails and uh, this time let's just say outlook.com let's see if it actually subscribes to outlook and we should get a beautiful message right let's go we get a beautiful message it means our mailchimp api is integrated well and it's working um now what i'm gonna do is refresh and actually enter the same email over again and now we shouldn't be seeing that it's added and it should be a different message you are already added very beautiful right very nice looking ui and if i enter something else let's say any other email this will literally this message should be changed and here we go the message is changed now and our link should work uh, as well so if I click on Twitter, it should literally redirect me to my Twitter profile. Um, beautiful, right? So really, really nice. And please uh, make sure you subscribe to the newsletter as well. Because uh, it's literally, I'm going to be sharing some really, really good things there. And also I'll be launching some stuff soon. So make sure you're tuned in. And just like that, guys, um, by the way, the next bills are going to be with database and a lot of different stuff you guys have been asking uh, for Prisma and Postgres SQL. So there'll be some really nice stuff I'll be doing. I'll be using PlanetScale as well. So thinking of using PlanetScale and 
even TRPC, I'm trying to look into it as well, uh, the TRPC side. But yeah, next buzz are going to be really, really sick. They're going to be with database and stuff like that. So yeah, make sure you're tuned in. And that's it for this one. Signing off. Peace, guys.